Hello there, podcast listener. This is Matt. I'm Amanda. I'm Allison. And I'm Christopher. And you are listening to What Scares Us, a podcast where four friends share the movies that scare us, freak us out. Maybe they don't scare us. Maybe they don't freak us out. Just movies that we feel like watching and feel like talking about that fall into the horror genre. Brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library. So today's movie that I selected as a big fan of it is the 1979 horror movie from Ridley Scott, Alien. It is also written by Dan O'Bannon and Ron Shusset and produced by Walter Hill and David Geiler. Just a little bit of context about this movie, even though realistically, if you're listening to this, you've seen this movie. It is a huge part of horror canon, and really it's, a, it's considered an important motion picture just in general. On the heels of the mega success of Star Wars for 20th Century Fox, the Alien script was moved into production very quickly, chiefly written by Dan O'Bannon and Ron Trissett with major rewrites from Walter Hill and David Geiler. A couple of little fun facts about it. Some alternate uh, possible directors they had lined up were Peter Yates, who did Bullet and The Deep and Breaking Away, so no horror movies, and Walter Hill, because he was one of the producers. Um, he, he is known for directing Hard Times, The Warriors, 48 Hours. He also wrote the screenplay for The Getaway. Again, kind of a weird fit for directing a horror movie, which is why they didn't go with him. Uh, this is also the second feature film for Ridley Scott, uh, who in the production did extensive storyboarding for it, which it really impressed the studio. Um, maybe the most interesting piece of uh, trivia that I found was some alternate casting stuff. So they talked about casting Meryl Streep for Ripley at first, um, but she was busy doing uh, Academy Award nominated stuff, I think. <laughs> And they also express interest in Harrison Ford for Dallas, but I think that would have been a little too on the nose. Plus he was already a curmudgeon at that point and turned it down. And um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a decent amount of, uh, of general trivia. Of course, I have a whole lot of it clacking around in my brain because I've seen this movie a million times. Um, very short synopsis of this is, and we, this is, it's debatable if this is a good one or not. This is just one that I found. After a space merchant vessel receives an unknown transmission as a distress call, one of the crew is attacked by a mysterious life form, and they soon realize that its life cycle has merely begun. So kind of vague, but uh, yeah. So like I said, I've seen this movie, I don't know how many times, Um what is it? What's your experience with this? I've actually seen the second one, Aliens, from 1986, James Cameron's Aliens, more than this one because it came out in 86 when I was a kid and it was much more accessible for me to just see on television. So when I picture some of the visuals of the movie or of Alien, I picture them from Alien, the second one, Aliens, not Alien 2, Aliens. Um, but I love the first movie. The original Alien is so good. There are so many great elements. I love the way it's shot. I love how simple it is, how beautiful it turned out. And I love how much that it is held up and how well it was done at the time. So I, I don't know when I, when I first saw it. It was probably it. And I don't even know if I saw that before I even ever saw Aliens, the second one. I actually have no idea the order. I've seen Alien, the second one, more than any of the other aliens that are in the, the series. So super excited to talk about this today. I remember when Alien came out in the theaters and the, the previews or the trailers would show on TV. It was so scary. I'll never forget, in space, no one can hear you scream. And my father would not let me go see the movie, thank God. I have a friend who's the same age as I am, whose father did take him to the movies to see this, and he had a full-on panic attack in the movie theater. Uh, I saw the movie later and loved it. It is one of my top five horror movies of all time. Really enjoy it. That's awesome. Christopher, how old do you think you were when you actually did see it? I must have been in high school, so I would have been probably 16 or something. 
the, I'll just say one thing about the movie that has always stood out for me so much is that it's the characters in the movie that make it so good and so scary. Yeah. Of course, there's the alien, but that's not why it's so devastating. I think it's the characters. So I had actually never seen this movie before. I don't know how. Um, so I was really excited to watch it for the first time. Um, I will say, though, that I had lived this experience before because um, when I was a kid, they've actually replaced it now, but my favorite ride at Disney World was the Great Movie Ride. Um, so if you don't know, um, like the Great Movie Ride was a ride that took place in this big replica of the Grauman's Chinese Theater. And when you go inside, there's like this huge queue with all of these real movie props like one of the pairs of slippers from wizard of oz there's all these like really cool props but then you get on this big ride vehicle that hosts like um maybe like 50 to 100 people and you have a real live like human cast member who's your guide through the movies and so the like conceit of the ride is that you're going into the movies and so it starts off super slow you see like the hollywood land sign and you see like an old um like synchronized dance thing from a movie called uh, Footlight Parade. You see um, an animatronic of Gene Kelly and he's like swinging on the lamppost and singing in the rain. And you see um, like Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke, they're on the rooftops and they're singing the song from Mary Poppins. And then you go into a 1930s gangster movie followed by a scene from a Western and depending on your ride car, in one of those scenes, real humans come out, either gangsters or cowboys. They kidnap your guide and they take them off the car, like into the set. Um, <laughs> and then the bad guy, like, come, he like hijacks your ride vehicle. And so, as an adult, you hear this and you're like, wow, that's like pretty inventive. As a kid, you're like, it's Holy terrifying. Fuck. A bad guy <laughs> just took over my car. <laughs> and we're all gonna die now right and then the very next scene you go into you're in the nostromo and it's this like very wow. realistic set of the nostromo there's all these like really cool easter eggs um there's like the little birds that are on the dining room table there's um brett's like hawaiian shirt is all ripped up there's an animatronic of ripley and she's holding um like a flamethrower um, you see down this hallway that's like exactly like it is on the actual set of the movie. There's um, like the astronauts or the like space suits on the wall and you can hear the alien breathing. There's water dripping, there's fog getting like shot yeah. into the room. And then this huge, like huge animatronic alien comes down from the ceiling right above you and is like reaching out, trying to grab you and then disappears into the darkness. And then on your right side, the alien comes back out on the right side and is like reaching out, trying to get you. And then you go on to an Indiana Jones scene, which is like the best. But as a kid, it freaked me out because as a kid, your imagination is so big that it's real you're yeah. actually trapped in this spaceship and this alien is actually trying to get you. And it's the oh. exact same atmosphere as um, when you watch the movies, but it feels so real because you're in the movies. Yeah. Um, so that was actually like a huge influence for me. I thought it was the coolest one as a kid because I loved like horror and um, like sci-fi stuff like that and actually being scared. But unfortunately they uh, ripped that ride down in 2017. Which is the, I was devastated when that happened. Yeah. Yeah. I the last time I went to Disney World was August 2017, two weeks after they closed it. So I was oh, like no. close but no cigar on riding it for a last time. Over. Well, that sounds terrifying. I can't imagine being a kid in a car and you're already afraid because your guide got kidnapped, but then to have this seven foot tall like alien with the long like you know appendages reaching around. That sounds so scary. It sounds awesome. But even if like if it, seeing the movie in the theater with all of the breathing and the quiet and the fog is terrifying for like a high schooler to see in the movie theater, I can't imagine like being like you were literally trapped in a box with an alien at Disney. That sounds awesome. And also, Allison, I'm so good you got to have that experience. But I wonder what effect it had on your viewing of it, the film for the first time. Right. 
which I know we'll get into it. The other thing is, like, I've never seen Alien before. I already knew most of the plot points because it's so enmeshed in the pop culture. So, like, I've never seen this before, but when Prometheus and Alien Covenant came out, I saw a picture of Ash's head. Like, uh, I've seen the basketball scene from Alien 3 for some fucking reason. (laughs) Four. Oh, four? Yeah. Where she, like, shoots it backwards. That's, like, so cool. It is, um, as somebody who loves the franchise, it's one of the hardest scenes to stomach in, in all of the Alien movies for me. Um, Ooh. But well, Alien, Alien 4 has that scene? Alien Resurrection. Um, okay. Which it, I haven't seen. And I want to find that scene just to watch that one scene. I don't want to watch the whole movie, though. But that's, if it's, like, scary, yes. It's not scary. Oh, no. Um, no. It's not? No. It's not. Uh, oh, okay. It's such well, I don't a, want to watch it's like I don't want to digress too much on that, but that movie is such a problem. Um, um. I like I don't even acknowledge. I I think it might be the worst of all of the like the, all of the alien movies. Even the, the newer ones. Oh, absolutely. The I yeah oh. I think that Resurrection. So I guess this that I can. I'll find a way to, to loop this into my experience with Alien. Uh, I, so I first saw Alien when I was eight years old, which is way too early for a kid to <laughs> see something like this. Um, and the, the, the reason that I saw it is, I, I don't know if you guys remember um, at Briarwood Mall, there used to be Suncoast, which was like a, a like oh, video store. Suncoast. Yeah. Yes. And so I was a kid and we would go to the mall. We would go to what was once record town that became FYE and then Suncoast. And I would just walk around and look around and I'm a seven, eight year old kid, whatever. For one reason or another, I don't remember like the exact day or anything, but for some reason I was an eight year old at Suncoast with $50. Whoa. (laughs) I know. And like, and $50 in what year was that? 95. Uh, is a lot, especially for an eight-year-old. Why did I have it? I don't know. But <laughs> while I was there, I'm kind of looking around at, at, and like the possibilities are endless. Like I could get any movie that I want because I'm also, I think I was like with my brother, like my parents weren't there and because it's Briarwood Mall, it's teenagers that are working the catch register. So they don't care if an eight-year-old brings up the apple of my eye that day was I saw the Alien Trilogy. And it, it just looked cool, the box for it. Like, it just had the egg on it, which is, you know, like the cover of, of Alien. And it just, there was something about it that spoke to me. So I just bought it, sight unseen. And then that night I went home and I watched Alien and Aliens in the same sitting. Um, huh. And it was, it like, it was transformative. Now, I had already seen some scary stuff before that. Like I saw The Shining before that and I had seen seven, which is crazy, but I, I had seen both of those. Um, so it, it wasn't like horror movies were new to me necessarily, but these were. And Alien, I thought was incredible. Aliens, I actually like more, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. I think they're both 10 out of 10 movies, but um, Aliens is just kind of my preference, even mm-hmm. though Alien might be the better film technically speaking. Um, And then the franchise kind of falls off for me, like a lot. Um, And there are a million reasons for that. uh, Alien 3 is, I think, still has its good points. But like, you know, circling back to Alien Resurrection, Alien Resurrection was the first Alien movie that I got to see in a theater. Um. So being this like crazed fan of the first three i'll say because when i was a kid i didn't have a lot of nuance in my opinion i just was like they all have aliens in them i like them (laughs) Um, uh alien resurrection i remember finding out in like the early early days of the internet that like they were making a new alien movie it had sigourney weaver in it and i I didn't understand how based on what happens Mm -hmm. in alien 3 but it was fine and then seeing it in theaters and even at because that was 1997 so it was 10 even then knowing like this isn't good um yeah yeah and then they just continued to make 
movies for yeah. some reason. But it's so nice that you were able to have that experience because even if you knew it may be going downhill, it was still since that was the first time you got to see any of the ones related to the ones you loved in the theater. Yes. I mean, that's still an awesome experience as like a young movie fan. Absolutely. Like, yeah. And really, <laughs> these movies like blew open my my interest mm-hmm. in seeing, you know, like like you know higher art movies like because because Alien is you know I mean really it's a it is. I'm getting ahead of myself in, in, in terms of rating this, but this is almost a perfect movie, I think. Mm-hmm. It's, it's beautiful. You know, it's it's stunning. It's scary. It's serious. Like, it, I think one of the coolest things about it is that it takes the, the premise seriously. There's nothing, mm-hmm. like, there's nothing tongue-in-cheek about it. It's gritty. It's dirty. It's kind of... It's small in terms of how many people are in the movie, but the, but obviously the grandeur of the sets and everything, it's just, it's, it's this kind of movie done better than anything before it and almost anything since of this type, at least. Think about what came out around the same time. So Star Wars was 77, which did look and sound amazing. But then two years later, Alien comes out and it does not look like a 1970s movie at all, in my view. You know, and if you think about what else came out in the 70s, you know, Logan's Run, I love it. It kind of looks a bit hokey today or even... A while ago, it looked a little hokey, maybe. I still love it, but it looks absolutely nothing like Logan's Run, uh, like Alien, excuse me. Yeah, I agree with that. That was one thing that actually struck me on my first watch was how good it looked. It honestly, except for some of the um, like computers and like the machinery that they have on board, it looks like it could have been made like this year it's held up really well and i also really liked how um like it looks gritty but it looks realistic it looks very like lived in which i think is really different from star wars when i see star wars i feel like i'm watching like a western in space which is basically what it is but when i was watching this i it just looked real you know, and that really draws you in and makes it feel real, which is so important for the horror that happens later on. Yeah, and I feel like there were a lot of movies in like in that era in the late seventies where it could look hokey, it could look bad. And sometimes movies they did that intentionally due to that was the limited the limited equipment and style and budget that they would have had for that time period. But this just look it looks so sleek. And I as I was watching it again last night, it's just so everything, the color, the saturation, the way things are set, the way things are shot, the pans, it just all holds up. And just the visuals of the ship and space is just so different than, than watching things like Star Wars. The other thing I noticed is, um, like, I'm a pretty big fan of other sci-fi. And so, of course, I was comparing it to other things that I've seen. And um, one thing that blew me away was realizing that Star Trek Next Gen came out after this. And it has such a different aesthetic. Like... I feel like so many sci-fi things of that era are like very clean. It's like very, it's futuristic, but like a really idealized future. Um, And so this was like not only a breath of fresh air, but it felt so different. It also reminded me so often of The Expanse, which I love, which I'll probably talk about later. (laughs) Yeah. And I think some of what helps it feel so real um, something that, so I, again, I love these movies and I have watched every piece of documentary that you can about how it was made what, and read every interview and listened to, you know, like I, I really dive into the ephemera of specifically these first two movies from the franchise. And one of the, one of the things about Alien that makes it work so well is that set is real. It's all, all those corridors actually connect to each other. You know, it's it's like if you zoom out above where the sets were built, like you can see, okay, if this is this is the pods from the beginning of the movie, which then connects to this corridor, which goes all the way. So they so really like 
between the cast and then between the, the camera people, the lighting people, they all became familiar with the place and how to make it, make it work and make it feel lived in. Um, you know, the set, I mean, I, I feel like I could talk for hours just about the set pieces in this movie. They are really like pretty much any science fiction thing that I've seen made after this that tries to be gritty, tries to be dark. It borrows a ton from this, you know, and the, what you were saying about the computers and stuff. I love the way all that stuff looks. Cause it's like, it's really, this ship is kind of supposed to be like a piece of shit. Like it's towing ore that's mined from other, you know, they're essentially truckers in space, which is like something that's covered a lot in every podcast and interview and whatever. Like, part of why it looks the way it does is like these guys represent like this is just a small crew that was going to do a simple task of like we're bringing back this space ore to earth in whatever year is 2177 or something like that 22 22 ah okay okay i just looked it up 2122 okay one of them takes so, yeah anyway. 100 years from now exactly <laughs> 100 years from now, there will still be class struggles and they will be in space. <laughs> the pre-centennial. So for those of you listening to this in 2122, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the sets, I, I almost want every science fiction movie to have those same retro 70s computers in them. They are already so gritty and you, right from the beginning, you feel mm -hmm. this lonely depressed feel in outer space. Nobody is playing, you know, Pigs Crossing or whatever game that people are playing. Nobody's having fun on a computer. It's extremely cold and depressing and lonely. And I feel like those computers and the general set really add to that feeling right from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, you can tell I don't play any modern computer games. <laughs> I don't even know what that thing is that you mentioned. Pigs Crossing? What's it called? Oh, Animal oh. Crossing. <laughs> oh. It's not even on a computer. <laughs> I, I, or I, I love that, though. And now I'm going to call it Pigs Crossing. <laughs> Oh, one unrelated thing that I loved about the computers, actually, is I love how they just talk to the computer. What's the story, mother? Like, as if a computer would understand what that meant. One of them types, what are my chances? The computer is going to need to know that, like, you mean the probability of the crew dying or something. But there's mm -hmm. like, what's yeah. up, computer? <laughs> How's it going? Tell well, me everything. <laughs> it's like an early prototype of Siri or something. Yeah. <laughs> I know that I know that we're supposed to just like go with that like mother and they this is further established in the other alien movies that like mother is this like intelligent like this AI that exists like within the ship that just is like oh I this, this is how you know you talk to mother as a way to like start a process cancel a process whatever which is funny yeah. because like Christopher was saying so many of the other procedures like even just getting to that terminal where they talk to mother is like you have to open six little doors pull out <laughs> six little key cards turn them in at a certain point when you sit in your chair you have to start a thing that will turn it towards the monitor like <laughs> it's all very mechanical and cold but then also you can talk to to it well i think too with movie <clears throat> like considering that this movie is supposed to be set in 21 22 it's a way for the filmmakers to kind of create what they think the future would look like and this was in 79 so this was even longer ago than 100 years in the future so it's their way of just like creating this alternate version of what is possible in the future and this is apparently what we are looking forward to is having these sentient computers <laughs> also uh for all you eight-year-olds out there i do want to mention that I had totally forgotten about this until I watched Alien for the first time. But um, when I was in elementary school, um, I was obsessed with these 30 second bunnies theater uh, clips. And they have um, like a 30 second version of Alien with these like little animated bunnies. So if you are too scared to watch the real Alien, but you'd like to know what happens, I highly recommend 
<laughs> the 30-second Bunnies theater video. <laughs> Interesting. Does it have any of the, like, does something burst out of a bunny's chest in that? Yes. Oh. All wow. of the major plot points are there. Okay. You guys should check it out after this, because it's only 30 yes. seconds, but it's cute and funny. Yeah. Is it live or animated? It's animated. Oh, my goodness. That sounds but awesome. I had totally forgotten that I ever liked those. And so when I was watching Alien, I was like, wait, why is this? Why do I know about it? this already and it's because i watched it with little bunnies <laughs> was it something that was on like in the 90s like as a new show no or no it was um like it was on like e-bombs world or something like very so just... like early internet from my perspective um okay. but there were a bunch of them they do a bunch of like classic i think i think they do jaws and maybe pulp fiction or something it's like very a very odd fit but Jaws was actually one of the other movies that I was really thinking about doing for this first, for my first pick. Um, it was between Alien, Jaws, and The Thing. I think I like Jaws and The Thing more than Alien. I think I agree with you on that. I think. I think, I think Jaws, not that we need to get into this, but like, yeah. but, but. <laughs> Why is Jaws better than Alien? <laughs> I do think that Jaws is better than Alien. Really? Jaws and Alien are movies that I watch every year, like under some circumstance, even if it's just I'm watching the rest of it as I caught it somewhere. Jaws, I watch every summer. Jaws is a summer movie. I watch it every summer. It just puts me in the summer mood. I'm like, oh, it's July, 4th of July. Let's watch Jaws. Well, and they're both kind of similar in that they have these greedy characters and a threat that you don't see very much. And that's an important element in Alien, which we'll, we'll talk about later, is just this, this foreboding thing that you don't see and it comes to you in pieces um but i mean jaws and alien too they were they were just a year apart in their release and then the thing was shortly after and same thing with that too there was a quietness i think jaws is 75 i thought so 75 yeah i think so i'm curious if there was any influence probably not and, and really scott would never admit to it because he's pretty <laughs> proud of himself but not saying it's not earned but if you've seen Jaws and you are making a movie that is set with um, uh, an animatronic being that is a threat and you're making Alien and you've already seen Jaws, there's no way you can erase. Like, you can't do a movie about aliens in space without having already seen Alien. You can't erase those things that you say aren't going to influence you, but they are so really influencing you as a filmmaker, no matter what you say. I've, really I've watched enough stuff, though, with Ridley Scott, where especially when he's talking about, like, Prometheus and Alien Covenant, the stuff that he's done later, where he is, like, he is pretty sure that he had all of these ideas first and like he, so I could, I could see him just be like, I wasn't even a little bit influenced by Jaws. <laughs> well, okay. Um, he wins. Um, yeah. no, yeah. Jaws was 75. Jaws 2 was 78. There's Jaws a Jaws 2. two. What? <laughs> there are five Jaws movies. Allison, get on oh, it. Well. So Matt already knows this because I talked his ear off about it afterward, but I saw the thing for the first time in October and loved it. I knew very little about it, um, so that was a really fun watch for me. But because I had just seen that recently, it was impossible for me not to compare um, the the thing with Alien while I was watching it. Um, also, you guys really lucked out because if you had chosen Jaws, I would have gone on a 20-minute tangent about the Universal Studios tram tour. I'm well, so bummed I never got to do that. The California one still exists. Oh, but they've ripped out everything at the Florida one for the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, which the Jaws oh. ride was really cool. All right, well, are we ready to dive deep into space and discuss some awesome things that happened in 2122? You can't see this, but I'm wearing a spacesuit. <laughs> Obviously, the movie starts with the with the the title sequence where the letters are slowly being revealed, and that's obviously very cool um, and scary already. Immediately, the the score stuff, all of the sound design stuff, is like creating this tension. Even just when they're showing you how alien is spelled, and then we're immediately brought in to all the ship interiors. They're showing us all these computers. Everything's off. 
everything's dark, but then screen lights up. We have no idea what the hell it's, it says. It's just a whole bunch of mechanical noises. And we then find out after we go to that terrific scene of all of the pods opening up, everybody's waking up. And there's just kind of like this din of people talking. You can't really understand what any of them are saying. It's almost like if you're if you're standing outside of like a break room or a cafeteria or something and you're listening to people talk and you're picking up little bits of conversation here and there. How do you guys feel about this whole sequence? I loved the awakening scene. I had seen, I think, maybe a screenshot of it, but I didn't realize, like, I love the way the camera moves and the lights turning on it goes from like very dark to almost like blindingly light and then the tanks open um and then there's also those two white robes that when the doors open they sort of like flutter i thought that was really cool um i do want to share i when i watched it for i watched it twice for this but when i watched it the first time i wrote some notes and one of my notes for this scene is why is this guy's diaper so loose because they're all wearing those like loincloths or whatever. And the guy in the front, like there's some obvious space between the cloth and his legs. I thought they were diapers because I assumed it was anyway. I hear you loud and clear. I absolutely <laughs> like I was trying to remember what my feelings were the first time I watched it at eight years old. I do distinctly remember being like, those are diapers. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> The still, when you go to IMDb, the first still that pops up is those pods opening up. And I can see right now, John. it's John Hurt specifically. His diaper has all this space. <laughs> I don't even remember these diapers at all. I have zero recollection of that at all. <laughs> that just means that you are focusing on better things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will say like the way the movie opened, it's a good five and a half minutes before we see humans on the screen. So it, like Christopher mm -hmm. said, it sets up that quietness, that stillness, this like, what is out there? What is going to happen next? Because you are in that mindset for the bulk of the film. And I just, I love that slow open. And then you see humans and it's, they're just, you know, back to business. And here we are um, with or without diapers. <laughs> but it's, it's like five, it's like five minutes, 40 seconds or something before we see the people. And nor normally you would think that this awakening would be joyful or something. Everyone's coming back to life. They're waking up. They're seeing each other. I'm already depressed. Like, <laughs> this is not joyful. They're exhausted. They're confused. They're lost. And then it's revealed to us that the reason that they're awake is that mother that controls the ship has, has homed in on some sort of distress signal or beacon that they are contractually required to investigate. I thought that was really interesting. The first time I watched this through, I did a lot of comparing of like what I already knew about Alien versus what was new to me. And that actually was new to me. I didn't realize that like the whole start of this entire plot was there's this mysterious transmission. I also didn't know that they're not even supposed to be awake like in this. So that was really cool to me. I also thought it was very fucked up that you have like the two most um, sort of blue collar workers mentioning several times, like, what about this money? What about this money? When are we going to get paid? And then there's like the kicker of, oh, you need to investigate this or you don't get anything. I don't know about any of that beforehand. And I, I was wondering, you know, like I, one of my first notes is, there is not enough people on this ship. This ship is gigantic and they're, they're so big. Blue. Like no yeah. other sci-fi would there ever be. There's always like an away team and all the red shirts and like a huge crew of people. So that already was like interesting, unique and like sort of terrifying because like you can't staff a ship this large with a crew of seven people. It's impossible already from the get go. Also, when you consider space and like how you're breathing and what resources you're taking up, because at some, some point in the movie, um, all hell breaks loose and they're going to use the shuttle to escape, but it doesn't support enough people. So like, I never even thought about the skeleton crew because I feel like with movies set in space, you need to consider all those resources of like physical space and like the air, the breathing and food and all that stuff. But obviously we have to go down and explore this, uh, this distress call. Something I need to admit about, I watched this movie yesterday and I got about 
I got to about 15 minutes in before I realized that I accidentally started watching the director's cut. So something that is different that you guys maybe didn't see is a scene where they all get together and listen to the distress call. What? Yeah. So that's in the, uh, again, that's in the director's cut, but they all sit and listen to it. Lambert, who is identified as the navigator, but is also identified by the producers and the writers as she represents the the fearful audience member, mm-hmm. which is why she runs around terrified and, and is made to seem like irrational the entire time. She's playing it back for them and they're all kind of listening to it. And the 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 sound is strange and and definitely they even say that it doesn't sound human and it doesn't sound friendly, mm-hmm. um, but then they kind of move on from it. So then later, a little bit later, after the away team has gone down to the surface, um, Ripley recognizes it as a distress call. Do they understand that when they're listening to it or no? At that point, they are just, they think of it as an SOS. But of course, as we know, it was probably, it was too late. So once we've established our, our motivation, why they're going down to this planet, then we have the, they're all in the cockpit and they're doing this landing sequence and seemingly landing on one little rock fucks the whole ship up big time in a scene that is still very loud. It's way louder than I remembered it being. And there's just this loud, terrible explosion and hissing and alarms and this and that. And it's just more ratcheting up of stress. That sequence and really throughout the movie, there are so many cool miniatures used. That stuff all looks so good and it still looks good today. Mm-hmm. Whereas today it would be done with, with CGI and special effects mm-hmm. and it would and it would just kind of be whatever. It would sure it would be impressive, but like these were handmade mm-hmm. and painted and lit. One thing I noticed about this scene is um, they say there's no other channels open. And I just think that's such a fun horror trope. It's always like, oh, the phone lines have been cut or uh, the operator's in on it or there's no cell service here or, oh, the internet's really spotty out here in the woods or whatever. Their horror always needs a reason why you can't communicate with anybody else. Even though your entire ship is a mother and is a computer. <laughs> right. <laughs> that understands simple sentences. I also really loved um, when they're land. Is, is it the Narcissus? Is the mm-hmm. small ship? Yep. When they're landing that on the surface, um, I assume they're just painted backgrounds, but the yeah. backgrounds of space are really beautiful. That set, like that piece, like where, where you actually see them get off the ship and, and go exploring and try to find where this signal is coming from. A lot of that was real. They were on like one of the largest sound stages in London. I think it was Shepperton Studios. You know, they spent, I think at one point when I was watching the documentary about this, like one of the stagehands that helped build a lot of the sets said that he worked for 11 weeks straight with no weekends on building like all of this, all of that stuff, but then also the interiors of the derelict ship that they eventually get onto, which is a, which is a HR Geeker pornographic nightmare. Yeah, I love when they start exploring the ship before they find the eggs, just walking around in the stillness and just watching the, the colors and the shapes because it's so it's so similar to like the shape of the actual alien you see later. But I just love the all the little tunnels and how it looks like they're just like navigating these little tunnels and like just the visuals of the of the ship is really cool before they get into the lower level. One of my notes is uh, the little tunnel thing that they walk through right before they walk into that chamber with the big alien guy is really claustrophobic. I bet Christopher likes this part. (laughs) (laughs) I do love all these scenes. And then they get into the big chamber and there's, I don't remember if they call that figure the space jockey in the movie, because I, I had, I was of the era of collectible trading cards. So I still have all my alien trading cards. Wow. And that was the first time I remember seeing that phrase. But the other cool thing about this whole movie is they never explain. They raise the question of, hey, it kind of looks like that that figure is part of the whole console or built into the chair or whatever, and it's just left, and the viewer sees it, the viewer is still baffled, and that's it. 
and there's no explanation. And I love that about this. It's like, is this thing alive? This this whole exoskeleton thing? What is going on here? Oh, well. Uh... Well, and something that is mind blowing to me about that is that the studio considered cutting that set piece because it was it was cost prohibitive i think it i think at that time in in 70s money it was like 300 or 400 thousand dollars to construct that set and when they saw in the script that they were like this is gonna account for two minutes of this movie like why are we spending all this time on it i don't remember which writer it was they referred to it as their cecil b demille shot where they wanted it to be this thing where they pan back and they show you this massive sense of scale where it's like, you've never seen anything like this in a movie before. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, and what the hell is that? And they don't want to tell you because they like all of that mystery because everything in this movie is alien. Mm-hmm. I was particularly scared of that when I was a kid because it, it's just, it, I mean, it's bones, it's elephant. It's like, you, you can kind of see its eye, like the details of its eye when they get in close to it. And it, what the hell is it? And why did something blow out of it? Like, it's it's this perfect thing that unfortunately Ridley Scott, 30 years later, decided to totally ruin with Prometheus. But, you know, but that's just my own personal opinion. Yeah. Um, we digress. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I think it's important. And I love that, again, the unknown and knowing how large it is and just the unknown of, because you don't know what's going to, you don't know what it is because you haven't seen it. Well, in theory, if you're watching it for the first time, you haven't seen any of the other pieces. You don't know what you're getting into. Another little fun fact about that particular scene, especially when they, when they've panned way up above and they're showing you the size of that room. Part of what they did to give you that sense of scale is that they put children in the <laughs> spacesuits. So it's Ridley Scott's two kids and then two other, I think two other or one other kid. If you're watching them, you can see one of them is definitely like a kid. He kind of has like child movement where it's like, (laughs) um, you know, for the first time, I think, and I'm just realizing this now that the viewer is looking at something fairly clearly and not being able to figure out what they're looking at. This almost gets closer to the whole H.P. Lovecraft idea than anything else I've ever seen visually, where, Mm -hmm. you know, at the end of a Lovecraft story, someone opens the door and they see an unspeakable terror. Here, I'm looking at this thing, I can see it, and I have, my mind literally cannot process what it's looking at, you know? Well, and it's like, is it supposed to be in that ship? Does that ship belong to it? You know, it's it's this. And also, like, what the hell is the chair that it's sitting in? Um, again, we get a dumb explanation in the 2000s. But if but when if you're watching it in a vacuum without that movie existing, it's like, is it a gun? Is it sitting <laughs> in like a big gunner chair? Or is it, you know? Yeah, I do wish that I hadn't seen... Um like a still of the space jockey or whatever from Prometheus because he looks like Voldemort's like big buff brother. (laughs) Yeah. But I really loved all of the lead up to the reveal of like that really cavernous room and the space jockey. I think their suits look really cool. The light from the top of their head thing creates like this little almost halo around their heads and that's really the only light that's lighting the shot. I thought that was super cool. Parts of the lead up almost looked like found footage to me. It's like from the perspective of the suits. And I thought that was super cool. And it also, (laughs) that was one of the things that freaked me out about this movie. I, maybe it's just because of my age, but found footage has like been such a thing the last maybe 15 years, 20 years. But I find it spooky because it seems like real and it sort of, um, Mm -hmm eliminates like when you're watching a movie at the end of the day you understand that like a director is like guiding the camera and so there's sort of a disconnect there but something like found footage or like those shots from the um from those three and the away mission it makes it feel so real and there's no separation between like the camera and what is happening that was Mm -hmm. one of the parts that really sort of got under my skin with this movie another cool thing a funny thing but the space jockey is um, 
at at one of the premieres for for Alien, they uh, they had the actual space jockey piece outside of the theater, Ooh. and people were so ter- people were so terrified. Mm-hmm. It had such visual reactions to this movie that someone tried to set fire to it because they claimed that it was like a work of godless people, and like <laughs> and 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 um, they they. It still it still exists. I don't know where it exists, but they didn't successfully set it on fire. But uh, wow, they're just but. coming in with flamethrowers. Just be prepared. <laughs> exactly. I've I've never heard it called the space jockey. Again, I've just seen this movie casually like five times over my lifetime. I again, I don't geek out over it. I don't want to know all the details. I for me, I love more of the behind the scenes of like yes, they dress those children in spacesuits. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in this particular movie of like watching the entire six movies or learning about the xenomorph and the history and who was frozen and like for those pieces for this movie like i just want to watch a really freaking great movie that's visually captivating has a great story great characters great quotes scary monster and scene it's just perfect for me yep. that's the kind of thing that that i love about alien is you don't have to know any of these things i don't even really like sci-fi stuff a lot but this movie just does all of those things so well because it's so good Yep. And the more stuff you know about like where something came from, the worse it is, right? It's mm-hmm. like it's like the it is I think pretty much without dispute that the Star Wars movies were all made worse by the prequels. And this is yes. this is this is another case of like I don't care where that space jockey came from. I don't care that it's even called a space mm-hmm. jockey. I don't even know for sure. It almost seems like that is a term that was like when they were storyboarding it, they're like, what the fuck do we call this thing? I don't know, a space jockey. And then yeah, yeah. somebody who was doing merchandising stuff, you know, printing those cards that Christopher has, was just like, they were looking through notes and they went, uh, oh, it's a, it's a space jockey. And th- <laughs> now that's what it's called. I would like to defend uh, episode one, Phantom Menace, because I thought that was the coolest shit. Little seven-year-old me seeing it in the theater. The idea of a girl queen was like so revolutionary to me. I also love her costumes, but I've never seen that before or since. Like a girl, a little girl with power. I thought that was the coolest. Also, the end fight. Darth Maul with the double lightsaber, come on. The music is the only good part of that. We can we can argue about the merits of the Star Wars prequels another time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I think, but I mean, it's a segue if you consider like this. Um, Ripley, Ripley turns into the most like badass female character. Like she just set the bar so high, and yep. especially in the second movie, just unbelievable, unbelievable. What's interesting about the beginning of this movie, even up to this point, where they before we've even gotten down into the egg chamber you're not really led to believe that she's your protagonist. No one is a, is a firm, like, oh, this is a hero. If anything, like weird gender norms from the 70s and, and stuff make you think, well, it's got to be Tom Starrett because he's, yeah. I don't think he was top, maybe was, was he top build in the beginning of the movie? I can't remember. But it's almost like they pull a switch on you. Because well, think- Sigourney Weaver wasn't as well known as, as the other actors when she made this at all. This was like an early role for her. Very early. Um, she had appeared briefly in Annie Hall as Alvy's date outside theater, which oh, is, uh, and classic. then she was in something called Madman the year before that, but then she was an alien. And when I was watching the documentary stuff, some of the producers, they weren't sure that she was and this is insane to imagine now, they weren't sure that she was a leading lady or that she had leading lady um, stature and stuff, which is bonkers to imagine now. Because now it's like Sigourney Weaver is like, if she shows up in something, she elevates it. Well, and I feel like too, but even in this movie, the first, just the one, the first lone alien, like she has, she's not her fully formed character as we know her as in watching the, the the sequels to this. Like she is not like a completely badass heroine by the end of the movie. She does a lot of good and she saves the day and she is the lone woman standing. But you're not, like for me, I'd seen aliens and I already knew that she was this fierce warrior. And so it sort of, I already knew that she was like the badass. She was the one, like, because I'd watched aliens before I'd seen alien, like as a, as a young kid. But yeah, I mean, that for me, that's like just the my favorite part of these movies is her. I really wish 
I thought this in like a couple different ways, but I really wish I had the opportunity to see this movie without knowing who Sigourney Weaver was. Um, I actually, right before I started watching it for the first time, I wrote down everything I knew about Alien and then everything I knew Sigourney Weaver from. And um, like after having seen her in that like mech suit in Avatar, it's like, it's still cool to see her, but it's, I've already had her established as like big action movie star in my brain. So it's hard to go back and like see her without that. Um, It also made me frankly, like so sad and disappointed because I couldn't think of a single other female action star who is as like realistic and cool as she is in this movie. And this movie was made in 1979. Like it's tough. Cause like you could make an argument for Linda Hamilton I was just going to say, Terminator. Yeah. That's the only other one I can think of. But she's also, but even in that first Terminator, she's still like kind of in distress and going, ah, you know, Mm -hmm. but then by the time we get to um, career two, she's like, she's made of steel. Dude, they're all a bunch of Tomb Raiders at that point. You know, after all, what all three of you have said about the transformation of the Ripley character in this, it does make me realize that's another reason I like her and this movie. She is just another uh, crew member at the beginning of the movie. Listen, when you watch uh, Indiana Jones movies, he's already this hot shit fly boy who can do anything he wants. And that's, it's like you already know what kind of movie you're in for, right? But this yeah. is so much greater. It's like, oh, wow. That could be me. Like, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I just signed on to this flight to make some money because I'm desperate, you know? Well, here's a question for Matt or if somebody knows. Like, I feel like, was Aliens, the second one, or like that came out in 86. So there was a bit of a lull between whatever issues they had and getting that made. Like, was Ripley supposed to be that character? Was she supposed to do those things? Like, I know in the first one, this could have been a standalone movie where she went off and sailed into the sunset and her and the cat, they got back to earth in six weeks and everything was fine. But then when she gets back there and then she basically has to go off to save the day to rescue that crew. But like, was it said that she was going to have that trajectory or was it because she was one of the first females towards the end of the movie who was the hero in saving the day that they wanted to do more with that? Or is that, that sounds pretty progressive for 79. Uh, it's true. And I know that they didn't have plans of being like, okay, we're going to make a sequel out of this. Like almost like they do with every fucking movie now they it wasn't until james cameron wrote the treatment for aliens and sent it to them being like this is what you could do with that character that 20th century fox and walter hill and david guillard went yeah that's a good way to do it like and and if you and actually if you read his original treatment and and script or screenplay it's like it really ramps up how much of a badass she is um so, like, you can kind of give a lot of credit to James Cameron for that. But um, but really, like, you know, she's almost made to be like a snitchy hall monitor at the beginning of this movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, when they're, when they're down looking around the, the derelict, it's just like she's talking to Ash and, and like, expressing concern and saying, like, that, you know, I, I, I looked into what that beacon noise is, and it's actually this. And... And yeah. he's kind of, you know, before we realize what his motivations are, he's already kind of steering them in a certain direction. We don't realize it at the time, but like he's kind of brushing her aside, which is almost saying to the audience, just like, you don't need to listen to Ripley either. The first note that I even wrote when I was watching this is <laughs> no one listens to Ripley. And mm-hmm. it's true, you know, because uh, and this is particularly prescient now in 2022 she's the one that's just like we have to obey quarantine rules mm-hmm. and like and i don't know about you guys but i have a hard time imagining what i would do in that situation i, I know that i want to say like no i would do what is smart and what's safe because that's i don't know if i would be like oh you can't let him in you can't let him in we're all gonna get sick and die or if it'd be like we have to save this guy's life let's well, do thinking about like like their history or their experience, how many missions have they been on? You know what I mean? If, you, if you're if you going to compare like her to somebody like Tom Skerritt, where is, he being Dallas is, is like the commander, you know, like he's making the calls. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ash is the one who ends up making the science calls. It's interesting. It's interesting. And two, I mean, 
what if you're just having the one alien movie and then she's the only person standing at the end so if you want to make another one it's got to start with her in some way and they could have totally had somebody else swoop in and she trains them and they become the hero but they just kept her character and i just think aliens is so great Al the number two aliens james cameron is so great i just it's i i love it i know we're not talking about that movie today but i just think the evolution of ripley as a character you need to watch alien and aliens and then stop and just yep. and leave it alone yep um one of my general notes that i wrote is uh the moral of this movie is like listen to women or die <laughs> so many moments like yep. you're please write about quarantine if ash hadn't fucked everything up right at the beginning none of this would have happened mm -hmm. sorry uh olivander you would have died but um there's also several different lines throughout the movie where Ripley has to be like, are you listening to me? She has to close the, the door on uh, Tom Skerritt and like, yo, listen to me. And they never do. And she's always right. Yep. Listen to women or die. Yep. <laughs> yep. And we all do. We yes. all do. Can we go back to the spaceship and the yes. egg? Kane yep. is just poking around at those eggs. And I'm like, yo, you know something's in there that's not human. Why are you poking at that egg? And he pokes at the egg and then boom. Stupid human hubris. Face hugger. Freaking amazing. And I, when I watched this in the 80s, I don't know if this is called a face hugger, but it's been deemed the face hugger. And it is so cool. That sequence of, I mean, first of all, just being lowered down into that cavern is already cool. And it's giving you this huge sense of scale. And when they show you that big matte painting, and you see, like, I think something that I was always curious about and still when I see it, it's just like, you can almost, you can see behind him when he's lowering down, you can see this massive hallway that wraps around, which just, and, and the ship is like, I know it's alien and you just have a million questions already, but it's just like, there's, there's so much open space in there. It's like, what the hell is this used for? And like, why are there, you know, why are there eggs in this quadrant and not here and whatever, but by the time he gets down there and he's walking around and here's another spot where there is a, there's one little difference between director's cut and theatrical cut. So when he falls down into the chamber and, and pierces through the, um, the blue light that, uh, that makes noise, <laughs> um, <laughs> which, which fun fact that when they, the, they borrowed that light from the band, the who, um, <laughs> because they were on the same sound stage testing lights for some tour that they were on or something like that. I'm sure I'm getting some specific detail of that just a little bit wrong and someone will lambast me for it. But when uh, John Hurt falls in that thing, I literally yelled at the screen, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. Cause I, why did he fall? Did he slip or something or? He, it's this really funny looking fall. It's actually like, there are only a, there are like, four things that I have faults with in this movie. And, and like, this is one of them there. Like when you watch him fall, it's like, um, it's like when you see somebody in like a, in like a soccer game, take a fall, you know, he, like, <laughs> he falls really carefully down into that little egg chamber. Yeah. I was really impressed by the eggs. I had not seen this part. I didn't know it was going to happen. Um, I thought the eggs were very fucking gross to be honest, especially, um, there's like one shot where it's an egg with like sort of a clear film in the front. You can see the thing moving around in there. I thought that was really cool and very gross. And then when it opens up, it has like those white veins. Reminded me of like strep throat or something. Ew, that is so gross. I, ugh. It's very well done. It's really cool. Yeah. Ridley Scott was just super hands on. It's like when they show the side of the egg and you can kind of see into it. Mm -hmm he put on surgical gloves and got and, and was just fluttering his hands to They're basically sh <laughs> to show that. Yeah. And like, and you can see in the documentary, like they show him, like he is like in there and he's telling everybody how to move the camera and like, you know, and he had the wow. idea for how to like do, you do it through fiberglass because then you can, you know, and you put this like weird film stuff on it and then you can, you can kind of see through it and it makes it look like the, anyway, it's, but yeah, he did that. And uh, and I guess it was really smelly because, of course, it's 
it's an actual cow stomach and really a lot of the gore stuff and the creaturey stuff is like they got it from local butchers yeah like the blood and the you know like kidneys and stomachs and like just gross That's stuff and i yeah was simply just like a, a cow's or a sheep's esophagus or something and part of the actual face hunger yeah the 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 like tube that extends out that goes down kane's throat it it's hard to it's it's hard to tell and of course it's on purpose but like when he actually when it actually lunges out and and grabs onto him they shot a sequence of just it splayed out and the tube coming out and then also one where it's like lunging forward but they had to do it in slow motion and speed it up to make it look that way and they basically just used a couple of frames from from this gross shot a couple of frames from this gross shot and then a couple of frames of him with it already on his helmet falling backwards and because of the way it's assembled and this is true of any of the creature stuff in this movie because it's like just like really quick cuts and a few frames here a few frames there you don't see exactly what happened but you know that it was scary (laughs) and the sound effect that happens there is really like that screech and stuff is is really freaky it's 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 just oh it's just perfect back on the ship i love how ripley's just like Mm -mm. no we're not doing this we're not breaking quarantine she's like so calm cool collected and just like no no is a full sentence we're not negotiating no and also ash is the biggest asshole that's one thing that i thought was kind of interesting like i know that there's no way for someone to know ahead of time that he is a android right but he acts suspicious as fuck throughout the entire yeah. movie like he's always in the background leading them towards something oh you won't get paid if you don't go check this out um oh don't uh let them know that it's a warning signal because by the time you get there it's going to be too late opening the door like he's like an evil mastermind and he's not that subtle about it either <laughs> no and i think I think the first time you watch it, you maybe don't notice it quite as much, but I picked up on these little things this time. Um, There's a line that made me laugh a little bit when they first land and they're trying to fix the ship and they're talking about like, I don't know if we should go out there yet. And he goes, Oh, the sun's coming up in 20 minutes where he's like (laughs) trying to like encourage them to like, no, you should go do this thing. That is definitely my main directive, you know? Yeah. And there's, and like he, and like he's, and then he opens the airlock. Like he's, you can, he has a lot of these little glances and little things that now, like knowing that he's an android, like you can see them as robotic, but he's also just, uh, yeah, he's always up to something. He's always pulling their strings and steering them in a certain direction, even if it's not obvious the first time you see it. Or that weird scene where he's looking out the, the windows and he's just smiling. <laughs> yep. Do you remember that? He's yep. just got the, the weirdest smile. Yep. On, you know? <laughs> so odd. Yeah, Ian Holm but, plays that part just perfectly. He's yes. just Yeah, it's really part. good. And I love it when like the when he eventually um his head comes off and one of them is a Parker who yells, Ash is a goddamn robot! And yeah. <laughs> just like fighting this. Um right. he has some really good one-liners, but I just, I love that scene of like the white blood just squirting everywhere. It's so disgusting. Like the liquids in this movie are just like, oh, very cringy and disgusting. But you can see him start to sweat the little white beads. And you're like, wait a minute. Before you know officially that he's a robot, you see the little white beads and everybody see the white goop on his head. Um, but yeah, I just, I love that scene with the robot. Yeah. Yeah, Ash, I agree, is an ass. And so Ronnie was right. She had a feeling about that guy and Listen to women or die. <laughs> also, what is the deal with the cat? Why do they have it on the trip? Was it in one of the pods? Or is it just hanging out? No, it can't be just hanging out because how would it eat? I need a cat origin story for this movie. I- I've heard people have that exact same question about where Jones is, like where Jones is at the beginning of the movie. I think we're just supposed to assume like probably with Ripley or something. Ah. but i but we don't see until like until they're like oh there's a cat cat in the shot i think that having a a cat is a quieter animal than a dog it makes more because a cat is more chill but it makes sense to have another living breathing 
entity on the ship. So when they use that machinery to try to um, detect where the the alien is, that's helpful. I think it also sets up Ripley as sort of like this um, caretaker figure mm -hmm. because she's still at the end. She's got her flamethrower and the cat carrier. She's trying to save the cat and bring the cat to the shuttle for the big escape. But then also when the crew is out there trying to, they break up into groups to search for the alien. Um, the cat is a distraction. It's something to follow. Like when Harry Dean Stanton, he's like, oh, let's go find Jones. Why is he breaking from the crew? They specifically set up in teams to go search for the alien. But then they let Harry Dean go off on his own to grab Jonesy real quick. And that's also when he gets killed. But also that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie is the Harry Dean kill scene because you have this amazing, these long shots of the cat's like terrified face watching, um, dogs, or, um, watching Harry Dean get killed by the alien. So for me, though, that's sort of like why the cat, that's not the true facts why the cat is there, but for, the, for me, those are some of the reasons why the cat made sense to be in the film. Because you're not going to have a rabbit, you're not going to have a dog, and maybe it is like um, Sigourney's cat or um, Ripley's cat. But it just for those different elements, it made sense that that's why you needed to have like, the cat as sort of like a story device to make some things happen. I was just going to say, I wondered if like, I, I haven't looked at this before, but I'm curious if in Dan O'Bannon's original story, when everybody was named something different and Ripley wasn't even a woman, like if the cat was there and it was there as a plot device to just be like a, a scare fake out here or whatever, or like, you know, a thing for the very end of the movie. I'm not really sure if like Jones was written in later because I know that, you know, Walter Hill and David Geiler made huge changes to the story, including making Ripley a woman, making her the the hero, and and there there are a couple of other um, rewrite things that I don't remember exactly what they were. But speaking of the Harry Dean Stanton scene where he's looking for Jonesy, you also get to listen to him meow a couple of times. I love it. I love it. And I and like this is after he's he's like he says this is bullshit or something like that and then he and then he starts meowing yeah i really liked that scene where um he's looking for jones it gave me sort of like saw vibes because it's so mechanical looking um the lighting is sort of like yellowish which i associate with the saw movies um and all the machinery has really good textures. I noticed specifically there's so many really good textures and like uh, there's the water raining down, which is super gross. I don't know why he would stand in there. Yeah, with the liquids. There's so many liquids in this movie. Yeah. yeah I don't know why you would drink that. Cause I could like, when I tried to drill down and figure out what the fuck that was, it's just like, that would only be like condensation from like a boiler or like an engine or something like mm -hmm. what? carcinogens it's, that you just put in your body <laughs> yeah it's really dirty um also yeah just them letting him go off on his own th that's a death sentence they just like yeah him, like you just gave him to the alien like you just wrapped yeah. him in a little bow <laughs> sent him on his way good luck out there bud yeah. Him off. But I also like that it was sort of like, well, we've got to get the cat. Like that was, it was not even a choice. There was no, like, they were in disagreement about breaking 14, but it's like, oh no, please go off and potentially get murdered. We've got to get the cat. You got to find right. Jones. That was right. like not even an option, which I thought was great, but also kind of sets up the idea of the quiet, the pan of going down the corridors looking for the being, because we do that several times with the various characters who get picked off, but it kind of just, because the cat is able to be, and he's allowed to go through all of these areas that the humans aren't really, they don't have the same ability to like traverse through all the, all the corridors, you know, through all these little doors, and he can get in places that the humans can't. So yeah. it kind of gives you that creepy, um, not only is the alien hiding behind those, those little cracks and crevices within the ship, but the cat is too. And so it kind of just gives you that um, searching and hunting vibe where the cat is menacing behind things, but for an opposite reason than the alien. Right. The cat made me more on edge than anything. For the most part, I I didn't even know some of the characters' names until the second watch. Um, it was just like, oh, the guy with the Hawaiian shirt or whatever. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I saw the cat, I was like, fuck, am I going to have to watch this thing die? Because that's such a horror trope is like, oh, the new family moved in with a dog and the dog is the first to die or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But it was funny because when Harry Dean Stanton goes in that scene, I'm, I was, immediately wrote him off. I was like, oh, uh, he's dead. He's going to die. But as soon as I saw the cat, I was like, no, 
please like don't don't let the cat die (laughs) something that's interesting about that though is like we we all kind of know when someone goes off on their own in a movie like this like okay well that's the end of them because that's been for that's been established in a lot of horror movies but i wonder if when this came out if anybody would have been thinking that because I don't know that that was necessarily, I mean, I could be very wrong about this, but I don't know that that was necessarily a trope yet where it's like, okay, well, we're all, we're all looking in groups and one person breaks off. That mm-hmm. means that they're definitely dead. Mm-hmm. Something else that I noticed actually for the first time in this watch, Ripley mm-hmm. has this little line when she's using the motion tracker that Ash made where she goes, micro changes in air density, my ass, mm-hmm. which just further kind of establishes the way that she feels about ash where she's just like i don't trust this guy i don't like this guy it made this shit up like i don't know this thing sucks and it does seem like that thing kind of sucks actually it doesn't even work it's, yeah it, it's too stupid it's How like could it work through walls but you know also like you're a human you're standing right there why is it not detecting the people right but yeah you the cat and it's also just this perfect thing that when they when they when they set up that scene because they're showing like the you know, Harry Need Stanton has the fun thing where he's showing how the cattle prod thing works, and then Ash just from nowhere goes, "Oh, I also made you this little dustbuster thing that 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 senses movement." You know, m- pretty much everybody just goes, "Yeah, whatever." He's a science officer. Sure. <laughs> I I remember seeing something about the the chains and the dripping water in one of the documentaries I watched. And I think someone said to Ridley Scott, what's all this water doing here? Is it rain? You know, what is it? And he just said, it doesn't matter. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. I and totally I, agree. Yeah, I feel that way with so many uh, see, shots in this, like at the beginning of the movie, uh, is there a wind blowing through the cabin that's rustling these pages? It doesn't matter. It's cool and it's scary. When I saw the water dripping and the chains, part of me was like, um, hey, did Clive Barker watch this movie and go, hmm, I've got an idea here. I'm going to make this my whole thing. Yeah. (laughs) I bet that's true. I bet that's true of not even just him, but a lot of people. I mean, obviously, this movie is super influential and, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people tried to work with H.R. Giger after this and found him impossibly weird. But so we're back on the ship. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, we'll try to circle back to that. We're back on the ship. Another director's cut difference when, so when he's on the table and they cut the helmet off and they cut out to the hallway where you have Ripley, you have everybody. And then Ripley's coming down the, comes down the ladder. And the director's cut, Lambert runs over and slaps Ripley and says, you bitch. What? <laughs> Yeah. So in the director's cut, they basically are trying to add some depth to Lambert's character and like her and show how upset everybody was by Ripley being like, no, you can't come in. They left this scene and and she full on slaps her. Like they talked about how it like left a mark and she was upset and like, but then it's, yeah, it is a weird difference, but it's supposed to just add more depth to the characters. I think it's one of the few things that they added at the director's cut that I actually understand and like. But then they have this little bit of like off screen exposition from Tom Skerritt was like, all right, everybody stop being mean to each other. I don't remember exactly what he says, but something like that. He's such a dad. I love it. Tom Skerritt, he, the actors in here are so good, but I just love that Tom Skerritt is so Tom Skerritt in it. Well, also, I just love the fact that Harry Dean Stanton is in it. He, the man is in everything ever. So when I watched this maybe five years ago or so, I completely forgot about any of that. Then when I watched it and I was like, oh, Harry Dean's in this. I forgot Harry Dean was in it. Because he's just like, he's just so Harry Dean. There he is like in his Hawaiian shirt and he's just smoking and being Harry Dean. He just happens to be on a ship in space. (laughs) Being a smart ass. Yeah. I had like a pretty different viewing experience of this because I am not familiar with any of the actors besides Sigourney Weaver. So like you're like oh Tom Scare is so Tom Scare I have no idea who this guy is I can't name a single thing that he's in but I did realize I knew um a couple of the actors after and actually one of the horror movies I watched during uh the break is um the 78 Invasion of the Body Snatchers which also has Veronica Cartwright I think it came out the year before she's in a lot of stuff but I just gotta wonder like 
girl, are you okay? Because <laughs> both of those movies, she's just like, ah! Well, she yeah. originally was, she was under the impression from her agent that she was going to play Ripley. Which is so rude. Well, because yep. she was much more, she was, had been in more things and was more well-known than, than Sigourney. Yep. It wouldn't have worked, though, if the roles had been reversed. I would not have liked this movie as much. Although, uh, uh, something that's funny about what you just said is, to me at least, one of my notes that I had is nobody does wide-eyed terror better than Sigourney Weaver. Other than maybe Veronica Cartwright. <laughs> because, you know, I definitely believed that she was like like a like frayed ends terrified the entire time, especially <laughs> after after the sequence with Kane. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Which, you know, we don't, we don't have to dissect that too much, yeah. but like, I mean, that's, that is, it's probably one of the most famous sequences in, in all of cinema, something that when it happened, it hadn't been done before and it made people sick. It made people it's, and it still looks good even yeah. by today's standards. And the fact that there were, that it happened in stages oh my god how gross is that there's that first weird eruption where his shirt is all bloody and then it comes out it's it's boy whoever thought of filming it and doing it that way they really hit on something amazing well part of it was it was only filmed one time and that's what the puppet was doing and it wasn't coming out all the way Right, that second, like after that initial spray where everybody kind of stops and goes, holy shit. The second time, like the second lunge was supposed to be the lunge, but because they hadn't cut enough of a, of a slit down the shirt, it didn't, all, didn't break all the way through. But it's great because it gives you a chance to have more of like the bone crunching mm-hmm. and squelching noise. And also mm-hmm. just another excuse to fire blood all over that room. So those are like actual reactions of, seeing that happen for the first time, especially with Veronica Cartwright, because she was just freaking out. <laughs> she had no idea that they were going to fire a stream of blood into her face. Yeah. And I guess she went into shock and like, and like after they cut, you know, she just was like in despondent in her trailer, which, you know, I can only imagine, especially because of the way that, the, I guess it smelled like formaldehyde in the room and was just like, there was a lot of like cow's blood and. Body horror. But no, you're right. It's one of the, like it's a defining like piece of cinematography and like in the history of film, it just is super iconic. I will say for me, I guess I, guess I have a, an ill sense of humor, but when the, the alien, the tiny entity of the alien is fully burst out and is about to take off at the end, that little puppet thing that makes a little noise and runs off, it's too cute to me. Yeah. I didn't think that part, I didn't think, I think the scene is very scary. And I think, especially if you don't know what's going to happen, but like having the little guy go, and then run off, it was just like too cute to me. Yeah. Yeah. But those beating blood vessels in its neck. (laughs) It looks like a fetus. I also was not afraid of the little face. So when the face hugger uh, disappears or whatever earlier, my note is, oh my God, little baby's gone. He must be inside that guy. (laughs) But I love the little baby alien. I love how after he bursts out of the chest, he's like, (laughs) <laughs> we yeah. like run away really quick. <laughs> I thought it was I know that this is just like a product of the pandemic, but I was so like put off by how easily they take their masks off after they bring Kane on board. Mm-hmm. Like there's even a line that's like take your mask off and I yelled at the screen, "Why would you?" Like yeah. there's a crustacean stuck on that guy's face. What it, it, at yeah. the very least, that mask is going to stop it from, like, shoving that thing down your throat. It's like... And also, the mask has nothing, like... Because the- he tells um, Dallas, you can take a mask off. He immediately just takes it down. It's a tiny little clear mask. It should not have any effect on you standing there and looking at this this thing hugging this man's face. Like, it has no barrier on anything. It literally, like, prevents you from smoking, but they weren't even smoking cigarettes in that scene. But yeah, no, Allison, I had the same reaction, just considering like masks on, masks off is such a prevalent thing that's happening right now. So just having that be like an actual line. It's not just like a, a natural thing. It's something like, would have been more natural if I had just like lower the mask. I also thought it was really funny how um, when they like poke the, the face hugger 
and the acid comes out or whatever. I, I think it's so funny that Tom Skerritt like runs to go see like where it's falling. Like, dude, there are two doctors and you're one of them. Like there's three other people on the ship who are doing nothing right now. Let them follow the acid. Also, well, what's your plan? You but he's, well, he's the captain of this vessel. He has to, it, the ship integrity is important to him. Which is yeah. why he says a hilarious amount of times, that's going to eat through the goddamn hull. <laughs> it would have taken him longer to explain to the other people, like, run up and down every level of below this because we just poked a hole in this alien creature and it's not dripping ass. This, you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Also, also, he, also what is that little space laser knife thing that he's using? Like, I, yeah, I, yeah. I love that. Like, I, I've seen it. I've seen that scene enough times that I should know how that thing works. But the more I look at it, the more confused I am by it because I don't see a blade and it makes a noise. Like it's a laser. I thought it was a laser. Yeah. It seems like it could be, but I also didn't really understand how the saw that cuts his helmet off really worked until, until really this time. Cause I watched yeah. it in like a very nice, very clear 4k copy where you can see a blade in there, but um, what they use on the, on the, you know, on the, what they, they say a finger I wanted there to be a scissor that like snipped off the leg and then the leg just drops down and then the acid. I yeah. wanted the full, like appendage like droppage happening. Yeah. But the scene where they cut the helmet off is also so well shot because there's all that white gel or hard material or whatever it is. And mm -hmm. You know, again, by just showing the after effects of the face hugger bursting through his helmet without actually seeing it do that, I think it is so great in the movie. It's like, yeah. what? I don't even know what I'm looking at, you know, but it's creepy and gross. Maybe that's going to be my constant mantra in this <laughs> i don't know what i'm looking at but it's creepy and gross <laughs> i think that's awesome though i think that's i think that's the best way to think about this movie i don't know what that is yuck you know. <laughs> i also think it's really interesting i forget which character mentions it but somebody's like yo let's just put him back in the tank and if they had just done that would none of this have happened would they all have survived I remember at that point, Yafet Koto keeps screaming, like, why aren't they going to freeze him? Like, it's the first time that you can see, yeah. you can see him and Ripley on the same page when otherwise, like, they're just like, like he's constantly antagonizing her and like talking shit mm -hmm. to her. And which apparently yeah. in, in real life, like he was given the direction, like, hey, be mean to Scorny Weaver so that you guys are actually mad at each other. Which is why at one point later on, like she screams at him. Like, you, God damn it, shut up or something like that. I guess that was a real, that was like a real emotion in the moment. Nice. Because they were really frustrated with each other because yeah, Fat Koto kept improvising and going off of the script. And Sigourney Weaver being new to it didn't know that that was like a thing that you could do. Mm -hmm. So there was just like this built-in tension frustration that boiled over at that point. But those are also their characters. Like Ripley wanted to play by the rules. And yep. And then Sigourney wanted to read the script, whereas Yafet, he wanted to just like play off her and kiss her off so that, you know, their characters would have their reaction. But also that's his character. He's kind of the jokey, the mechanic, the more of the blue collar, um, him and Harry Dean together. They were kind of paired off. Right. So I like that. I like that little bit of history. But that's an amazing scene, though. Just all of them, the shot where they're visually just sitting around the table, like eating and chatting and making fun of the food. And then all this amazing... <laughs> Oh, and yeah. then it comes out. That's a beautiful setup, just the, the calmness, because you think everything's fine. Oh, it's unaffected. But you know it is because you saw the tube going down his throat. So you know something laying eggs inside his belly or something. But I just love that it's such a chill scene. And I love the visual, the, the, the wide shot of all of them at the table with their banter and the chatting and like just moving on from what had just happened. Yeah. Before it's the, like the second time that actually happens in the movie. You know, it's like the second time they have a little uh -huh. tension break. Um, yeah. You know, and you have that little line where Tom Skerritt gets to be be very dad like again and go, "Hey, I'm buying about one last one last meal," and uh -huh. you know, and then we're back to like they're all just kind of chit chatting. You can't really understand everything they're saying, but they are implying the food mm -hmm. sucks, which becomes this little great little joke because then he starts choking, but mm -hmm. then it gets serious. But in that moment, there's a really deliberate shot where if you're looking at Ash, you can see him really studying Kane. He's watching huh. him the whole time and he's definitely like mm -hmm. 
okay, he knows something is about to happen. But you maybe wouldn't notice it otherwise because you because everybody else is kind of going bah! at that point in the scene and, and throwing their hands around. And you're also looking at all of the like stuff on the table, which looks like there's a bunch of cereal. I think they're drinking like future space beers and like <laughs> you know, all this all this weird shit. And the and every scene is just full of it. But that one birds, full of birds going up and down. Yep. 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 It's just the best. It's such a great setup. And then obviously Kane happens. The scene really reminded me of the dinner scene in A Tale of Two Sisters, where like it's like either a normal scene or like, you know, something's a little weird about it, and then somebody like falls on the ground and like has a thing. <laughs> and I think it sort of plays to this natural um like the natural horrificness of either being a person having a medical emergency like a choking or you're having a stroke or a heart attack or something or being one of the bystanders like that's one of the scariest things in real life i think is like Mm -hmm. everything's fine until all of a sudden bam everything's not fine and you need to work really quickly to get this person help um Mm -hmm. so i think that's so effective because it relates to like a real life thing that anybody can experience at any time but the other thing that really struck me about the chest burster scene is it's shot exactly the same way that an exorcism would be shot in any other horror movie like the abruptness of it he's like flailing around on the ground the sound is like so weird there's like these weird like like he's Mm -hmm. making choking sounds but also like is the alien making sounds or something there's like weird squeals and like squelches Mm -hmm. like it reminded me of something like um the exorcism or like any of the any exorcism movie it seemed very similar to me yeah i think it seemed like they thought he was like having a seizure or choking or something because parker is like trying to like put a spoon in his mouth or something to stop him from like seizing Mm -hmm. which you're not supposed to do (laughs) yeah exactly is that right (laughs) 1979 yeah exactly yeah well there was the whole thing about like putting a if someone's having a seizure put a wooden spoon in their mouth so they don't like bite down and with their tongue off or whatever. Yeah. I yeah. don't think but I just love the food scene. The food I also love that this horrible thing happened and then it's like back to business. And I also because Allison mentioned a tale of two sisters, is you just have this like a group scene of people eating is such it's familiar to everybody. It's something cozy and homey, um in a lot of regards. But in here something terrible happened, but like, okay, let's back to business. Let's just sit down and gather and like drink our space beers and have some whatever space cereal. It's just back to normal, even though something happened. And I just love that because it breaks the tension, as somebody said, but it just resets, it resets the movie for the next, the next thing, which is a right. huge thing that changes the tone of the whole movie. And just going off of that, I love that after the chestburster leaves and they think it's over, they're able to have that moment where, you know, it's more lighthearted and they're all getting together to like eat. Um, mm-hmm. After the chestburster scene, it is silent. They're all just standing there in shock. And then the next scene, they are still silent. It's like such a difference between the beginning of that scene and the mm-hmm. end of the scene going into the next. It really um, exemplifies the how sound is so important in the movie and the quietness and the stillness, whether it's the camera panning through the ship or the, the shots of space and just the quietness of searching for the alien. And then when you hear like the alien breathing, you can hear the, boom, boom, the pulsing. Like all the sound is so important. It's it's really, it's so well done in the movie. I was lucky enough to see this in theaters back in 2003, I think when they reissued that director's cut and something I hadn't ever noticed before, because I had watched it at home on my, on my own TV was how quiet a lot of the movie is like to the point where the sound drops to zero. So that when voices come in, it's like you can hear the scratchy sounds of like whatever tape machine they were using to record those voices pop up and then they come back and then they pop back out to the point where like, for example, when they're looking for the face hugger after they notice like, Oh shit, it's not on Kane's face anymore. And they're walking around that room. I'm looking at their feet, listening for noises. And obviously they're walking really quietly, but there is no sound to be had except every once in a while they break the plane by being like, don't look in the corner, you know, which, which just makes you go, you know, a little bit more. Yeah, up in the corner. <laughs> yeah, right. With their little pen light things. Take this with you if you're going in the corner. There's also like 
breathing sounds in the background for a lot of the movie, which I assume is the alien breathing. But then later, um, there's also like a heartbeat sound, which is really good at like adding tension to the scene. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. Because you don't know where it is. And you just hear that the, the pulsing and the thumping and the breathing. You're like, is it in the room? Is that a hiss landing on some sort of like heat thing in the, is it the water dripping and getting on? Cause you don't know where it is. You don't know how well it blends into the scenery and then it's just there. I think the best use of all of that is the next <laughs> sequence with, with um, Tom Skerritt in the air vents where mm -hmm. you have all these big tactile. First of all, that whole sequence is just terrifying in general. It's dark. It's like the only light you can see is either from the tracker or, or just directly on him. It's a perfect build of tension because you have all these tactile sounds of like the vents closing. You have the thumping in the, in the vents themselves, which is just like, is that him that's doing that? Is it the alien that's doing that? And then like the motion tracker sounding like it sounds, it sounds like vital signs, mm -hmm. which with the, with the breathing noises, with all the thumping, like having this like beep, 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 it, raises your anxiety to a point where it's like it's almost too much um which mm -hmm. which makes it like my, my favorite part of that and also in that like veronica cartwright's character is a mess she is just she's trying to describe it to him but you can hear that she's like on the verge of freaking the yeah. fuck out she's you know again she's the audience she's you in your head you're just like oh fuck i don't know where it is either and then was... the alien jazz hands I laughed so hard at that part. I'd never <laughs> seen that before. And he's like, I'm home. <laughs> what? I'm sure it was scary to to people when they first saw it. it was still, it, I'm sure it was scary to me when I saw it as a kid. But now I can't help but just notice it going, you know, yeah. with its arms fully extended. <laughs> and its little fingers out. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I do love the like weird electrical um, thing that happens right after that. Like he reaches out and then it like powers down or something. It's like this is the visuals of that and the sound I thought were really cool. Yeah, like the screech and the feedback and then just mm -hmm. them trying to figure out what happened and yeah. That was another moment that reminded me of like found footage or something. I felt like Veronica Cartwright that entire scene. I was just like, what are you doing? Why is he alone? Why doesn't he have a weapon? He has like a flashlight and he's a flamethrower. 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 Yeah. He's yep. Lighting his way. Because mm -hmm. as he was going through the doors, he was like blasting it with. Yeah. <laughs> One of my notes is, uh, "Wow, people in the '80s were just really blasé about having flamethrowers in enclosed space." <laughs> is that the thing? They're just like, it's like, yo, you. There's a ceiling right there. You're you're gonna die. <laughs> Setting something on fire in a spaceship is just a bad idea. Poor poor Dallas. Dallas is toast. He go bye bye. Dallas went bye bye. We don't know where he went, but he went. I really love the backwards scene where the camera goes backwards um, when the sirens start going off. I thought that was really cool. And then also the hatch opens and closes in that like circular way. I've never seen that before. I thought it was really cool. I really liked how when Tom Skerritt as Dallas disappears, you don't know there's you don't there's no murder blood scene. He's just he's gone. And then um Yafit's character, Parker yells, No blood, no Dallas. And I just thought that was amazing because you know something horrible. It just leaves the viewer wondering, like, well, how is it killing and what is what happened to him? And is he like wrapped up and is he in a pod in some enclosure somewhere? Is he there to like host more aliens? Like you don't know. You just know that he's gone and is probably dead. And so I just really like the simplicity of like that. Again, that unknown, you just know something terrible's happened. Well, and we couldn't have fathomed if we if we had seen this movie truly in a vacuum, we couldn't have fathomed him being put in a hive or something like that, because that didn't even exist when this movie mm -hmm. came out. It was just he's just gone. But yeah. here's another difference with the director's cut. <laughs> so they did shoot a whole sequence and it's in the director's cut. And it's the biggest difference. Um, and it comes much later when, when Ripley is self-destructing the ship, she finds him cocooned in the bottom of like somewhere down in the bottom of the ship through a series of ladders. He's down there just moaning and saying, kill me. 
and also um tom uh, uh also harry dean stanton's character is is shown to be cocooned up there too but they didn't like the way that it looked they didn't think that it looked finished and they ultimately they just removed it whole stop mm-hmm. from um from the version that went that went uh out to theaters so huh. But I mean, it makes sense. I mean, that is a huge difference, but it also it makes sense because what is the alien's ultimate goal? You know what I mean? If it needs more hosts to create more aliens, it makes sense that they would be cocooned somewhere. Right. And then because later on, you do see the kill scene when he kills um, Parker and then Lambert. You see mm-hmm. that you see that they're dead bodies and you see that kill scene, but you don't see what happens later where the alien is putting like, what is the goal? Right. You know? For if there are there more hosts but again the, again that's knowledge that i can say in 2020 or in the 2000s or the 90s versus 1979 like we didn't have that that set up in our in the in the in the film canon at that point right it didn't have all the lore that it has i don't even think what did they even refer to it as a xenomorph in the movie i don't think they do Not a um time. so you know but well, that could have been fantastic in alien though if we had seen that that would have just taken it over the top of uh, of horror, I think. I know yeah. that for me, seeing that in 2003 in the theater, it's awesome. Like, it, it doesn't look bad or unfinished to me, that particular sequence. And you, it's readily available and easy to find on YouTube and stuff like that if you want to see it. It looks great. But um, the argument that they had made, and I think Tom Skerritt even made this argument, was that it slowed the pace of the end too much because suddenly you divert it off to do something when she's frantically trying to get from one end of the ship to the other to get out. Yeah. But they were just like, there's no time. There's no time because the clock is literally counting down and she's trying to get to the shuttle and she can't right. because the alien is in between her. That's one thing I had thought about earlier after um, they shoot the, is it Kane who is the chess bus? chest first mm-hmm. thing yeah they shoot him out of the airlock earlier <clears throat> and told was wondering like does he ever come back in one of the sequels like someone stumbles upon his body or something he's still out there he's just flushed on the toilet <laughs> essentially <laughs> actually and when the alien the alien gets released at the very end like Sigourney opens up a hatch and the alien is floating in space maybe the alien is able and to maybe re- came friends yeah, yeah. Just a misunderstanding. Yeah. It's his dad, after all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or mom, or mother, I don't know. Anyway. One thing that was really unclear to me, um, so the original facehugger dies, but it implants the little baby xenomorph. So am I supposed to believe that that baby becomes the full xenomorph, or is it another alien on the ship? It's just the one alien that's on the ship. It's like, because of there being sequels, you know, we, we now, we know because of aliens that there is a queen, right? But in alien mm-hmm. in a vacuum, it's just this one thing. And we have no idea how, it, how, it, how the facehuggers come to be. We don't even, you know what I mean? Like, it's just it's just the one alien that's kind of the end of its life cycle. So it almost makes the cocooning thing not make sense to me either. If if they left an alien, because how would it lay? How would it lay those eggs? How would those eggs come to be from like the life cycle that we now understand in this franchise? Which is just like there's these they're drones, the one that's like on the ship, and then there's queens, like almost like um. Yeah, insects. insects. Thing. Yeah, I, I think oh. even the design of the aliens is very insect-like. Although yeah. the facehuggers look like crabs to me. Yeah. Oh, I love the facehugger, but I did the same thing. I just, I just equated it to some sort of like um, insect life cycle, like a cicada. Something mm-hmm. hatches from the egg that looks completely different from the end cicada. Like it looks completely different. And so, if you think of like the the exoskeleton version of the cicada, that to me that's the facehugger. And then it, when it hatches is when it becomes the full cicada and that's when it becomes the alien. Right. It's um, funny that you mentioned that because um, Christopher mentioned that um, memory, the making of alien, uh, like making of DVD. And I actually watched that in preparation. For I did this. too. 
And one of the things that the wife talks of uh, Dan O'Bannon's wife talks about how he was like afraid of cicadas when he was a kid. The other thing I couldn't figure out is like, you know, the full xenomorph when it opens its mouth, it has that like secondary mouth that comes out. Is that the baby? And the rest of it grew around it? No, it's just it. No, it just is that way. Even though it's a good point, because when we first see it and it goes, like you don't (laughs) ever see a little mouth in there. I think it's just one of those like things that we're just supposed to go with. We're like, okay, it grows crazy fast. It gets huge, you know, and, and then it has that second set of jaws you know, which, which moves so slow in this movie compared to the way that they, that they whip them out in the, in the other alien movies. Yeah. It's just like, it's just like a, look at this. It's basically <laughs> every, it's just, it's just hanging out. And then every now and again, just puts its tongue out. Like it's Gene Simmons <laughs> or something. So yeah. my, my best friend for Christmas got the alien doll which nowadays is so expensive to buy the original, but you, there was a lever on the back of its head and you hit the lever and the whole jaws shoot out the mouth. I mean, it was an awesome, and it was just enormous, you know? Anyway. That's awesome. I feel like somebody at work had the action figure that had the mouth that did that. <laughs> oh, there's our very exactly. own Matt. <laughs> I was gonna say I've got a whole bunch of alien-related BS at my desk. <laughs> wow, it's just interesting because even if you think about the fact that I was way more familiar with watching the second Alien movie versus the first one, like for me, Aliens, the second one was like the main movie because I was old enough to see that not at the theater, but I saw it as soon as it was available, like on you know at the video store or on HBO or whatever. So Dallas is gone and Ripley is pissed and wants to know what the hell's going on with this computer. Right. And that's when that's when we learn about Special Order 937. <laughs> it's a great band name. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. And that's when we learn that, you know, there is a the reason that the ship woke up is this this like nefarious company that we only kind of see referred to or like we see their name plastered around the ship Wayland yutani they had an interest in collecting this species which how they knew about it i have no idea it doesn't really matter because the other movies will try to explain that to death yeah. um and and then ash knew about it and was pushing them along and then there's a little scuffle between the two of them where he gets shoved really hard into the wall. And Amanda, you said something earlier that I thought the same thing, like that he was sweating that Mm -hmm. milky substance. But I think Mm -hmm. from watching it again, I think we're led to believe that he hit his head hard enough that it's an abrasion and that he's now bleeding. But then it's also, he's he's starting to glitch. He's like, that's when like you see his eyes twitching and he's making these little like, these little like "Uh noises and shit. Uh Yeah. And what's interesting about that and like what that whole scene turns into, which is horrific, um, almost almost as horrific as as the chest pressure sequence um, is like, OK, because he hit his head, is he now malfunctioning? And, and that's why he wants to kill her. Or is he just like or is he still functioning as he's supposed to? And he's like, I just got to get rid of this one because she now knows what this is all about. That's how I interpreted it as as. She, she was too smart and he needed to get rid of her and yeah. the way he chooses to abuse her and kill her is disgusting. It's so weird and I didn't understand it the first time I saw it. I still don't really understand why your instinct is I'm going to try to shove this magazine in her mouth. Yeah, I thought about that too because um, that magazine in her mouth is not going to kill her. But I think it ties into all of the like very sexual connotations of this movie like the design Mm -hmm. of the alien and all of that kind of stuff i think it's no coincidence that the blood that gets all over all all over ash all over all the other characters faces is white i think that's like a pretty obvious um connection there but then also i was really confused because i was like he's obviously trying to kill her but that's not gonna kill her i think it's just like a very like sexual thing it's which like was weird and evocative yeah, yeah yeah and also the there's images of naked women in the back 
background, there yes. is a close-up of her face with this magazine being shoved in her throat. And in the background, there's like basically just like porn, porn. Yeah. images. And I'm like, are you really? And I never noticed any of that when I watched this the past several times. But having watched like the one of the behind the scenes things and then watching that scene, I noticed the naked images in the background. I was like, oh, that just even like, you know, force it brings it even further to light what they're actually what's happening. Just as I think just the magazine is like a Playboy or a penthouse or something like that too. Wow. So it's just like this. It's a it's a terrible little corner of the ship. I don't know whose corner that is, but I was gross. Ask whose corner? Because it can't be Ash's. Because why would uh, uh, is he that sentient where he wants like you know naked women on the walls of his little area? No, it but can't be Ash's. Whose area was it? Terry Dean Stanton. Oh, oh yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in addition to the obvious. Uh, you know, sexual connotation. He's trying to shut her up too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, he's just trying to, he's just had it at that point. And um, it, it's, it seems more just rage filled than even trying to exactly kill her. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's such a weird, violent, horrific scene. Mm -hmm. it's very long too. the scene with the magazine being shoved down her throat is very long and it's, i'm like how is it not doing anything and hurting her yet because it takes a long time for people to come in the room and help her i have something embarrassing to admit <laughs> um i already knew that ash was an android that had been spoiled for me because of the internet right but in the moment where it's revealed that he is an android i gasped and yelled oh my god this is Bilbo Baggins this is Ian Holmes <laughs> because the entire time I thought that Ash was played by Tony Shalhoub Monk oh. the guy from Monk yes so all of my notes <laughs> until here are like that one guy from Men in Black is a dick Monk is such an asshole because I thought it was Tony Shalhoub the whole time it would also be such a different movie if Tony Shalhoub played. <laughs> played. <laughs> oh. my, my main note here is that Ian Holm is just perfectly terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, I think I touched on this earlier already, but this scene is almost more upsetting and more intense and more jarring to me than even the chestburster thing. I remember being a, a eight-year-old boy and being that blew my mind apart just like his and i couldn't believe it that holy shit that's a that's a robot and he's he's full of milk and, <laughs> and weird little marbles in the moment when he's when he like grabs and rips her hair and then when he just like he just grabs onto yafet koto's like chest it gives him a purple nerf or <laughs> yeah right, right right it's like it, like when you see that and you don't realize that he's an android right away you're just like what the hell he doing um yeah but then when you imagine it as as just like oh he's grabbing him harder than any human could ever do anything mm -hmm. like it's all played so perfectly and again he's like twitching and his eyes are doing crazy stuff he's making crazy noises mm -hmm. um him spinning around that little corridor on the wall, spewing the, the like, whatever it is. I don't know if that fuels him or what. And there's this horrible rent, like, after when they, when, when he finally gets hit with the extinguisher and his head rips backwards, there's this terrible, like, almost like the sound of like a shipwreck, like iron wrenching noise. And it's like a big orchestral cue up that is just, Oh, it's it still is so gross and so effective and yeah. Like, can you imagine sitting in the theater in 1979 and watching that? That's so good and so fresh to be seeing that and to be you don't know he's a droid. Like, maybe maybe there are some people who you're figured out you can't trust him. What's going on? You're not thinking he's a droid and like white juice is gonna fly out of his head when he gets knocked off in an hour. Like, it's so good. And I just really wish I would have been able to experience and had that, you know, because when I watched it, I didn't really think about it or pay attention to it. But watching it like as an adult in 1979 in the movie theater, can you imagine the magic of that? I love when he smashes Ash's head off. I was like cheering. It was so cool and very unexpected. I had seen a picture of um, Ash's like 
just his head on the ground with all the white stuff all over. Um, and actually, the first time I saw that picture, I thought it was um, Ty Burrell from Modern Family. <laughs> what? <laughs> they look similar, trust me. <laughs> I have to look up how old he is real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Not nearly old enough for this. Yeah. No, but that is... <laughs> I don't think Tony Shalhoub is either. I don't think... Yeah. No. Oh, anyway, that's that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so they so then they they start trying to juice him for information. They mm-hmm. plunk his head down on the table, and there's that the only really bad looking shot in the movie where there's that jarring switch between the the dummy head. And- oh, yeah. I was really sad. I rewound it like three times last night when I was watching it, and I was like, could they have done it at a different angle and then done that angle? That way it wouldn't have been so jarring. All Do they, they want to- it to be jarring? In my mind, all they would have to do is just cut to like whoever was manipulating his head just for a second, just kind of like moving it and like making him, I don't know, <laughs> looking like they're they're working up a sweat and then cut back to, you know. Yeah. So it's the only shot that like, and it, it bothered me when I was a kid. It bothers me now. Like it's, it's, it, but not enough to take me out of the movie because of course, like what you're looking at, you're just like, holy shit, that's so gross. <laughs> um, and they they slam the table and he spits up all that milk. It's just ugh, extra gross. And he's got this perfect, like, you know, I don't know how you could have fathomed at that point in the 70s, like what a damaged android would sound like, but it's perfect. It's just like he's he sounds broken, but his brain is, you know, well, his, his brain is still there because he's able to, like, explain to them what the deal is and he's even kind of he's still a little sassy with them oh um, yeah the yeah, the fact that uh, what's his line he says i i don't want to tell you what the odds are or something but yeah, yeah. Or I, he says i sympathize but you have my sympathies thank yeah. you sorry because then yeah. he does a little smile oh yeah. my god it's, it's even awesome. worse to talk to him Yep. You know? Yeah. 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 I, I do like to imagine his like inventor or whatever, like, oh, he's gonna be a smarmy little asshole. Like this is the exact uh like configuration of his mouth. <laughs> In the canon, they do go into like the people that made him and like what the difference between his model is versus Bishop and Aliens and this and that. But of course none of, none of it matters because in the it's yeah. really you just have this is the secret villain of the movie the alien is a villain but ash is the real villain because he put them in this situation and now they just have this thing in the ship that doesn't have any specific motivations other than get stuck Mm -hmm. in walls and stuff yeah yeah it's a really great instance too of a robot or an android taking on so many human qualities and looking so real and behaving so real i thought that that was very scary once you know that he's a he was an android or robot the whole time that just makes it just makes it to me it made it even more scary but like whoa like what yeah. else is not real that could be real so it's a really well done like a robot that's so humanized and like with the skin and the textures and like how he behaves and the smile at the end i'm like what that's yeah. that's good good programming <laughs> yep yeah i was really surprised by how much of an active antagonist he is the whole time so i didn't really know anything about him besides he is an android but just constantly throughout the movie he's pushing them in a certain direction or like convincing them that they should do something he's yeah i was really surprised on how much of an influence he had over the plot of the movie who yeah who's the real villain in horror movies it's I think it's rarely the obvious person who gets top billing. It's not the alien exactly. It's each other. <laughs> and in this case, maybe it's not exactly the Android, but it was probably the, the uh, company, the corporation who mm-hmm. wants the money and they want to yeah. do something uh, to get the alien back yeah. to earth. It's, and that's the other thing I find fascinating about horror movies. It's, you know, it says something very deep, I think, about humanity and who the real villain is. Yeah, because really it's like Ash is like the motivations of this larger company. So even though he's an android, he does represent the motivations of Mm -hmm. of shitty humans. Right. 
and he mm-hmm. has impulses and characteristics of shitty humans. I really love the shot where Ripley's finding everything out in the like mother room and then she leans back and he's right behind her or like right to the side but mm-hmm. from the camera angle it's like he's right behind her. That was really cool. I've never seen that before. When he instantly tries to manipulate her in that moment, he's like, there's a perfectly good explanation for all of this. And this is after she's just read Crew Expendable. You right. Know, which is just. Which I oof. think adds to his motivation in killing her later. Like, she's expendable, so just get rid of her because she's going to fuck this whole thing up. She's too smart. Mm-hmm. I really liked. Uh, is it the mother screen? There's some computer screen where it's like a black screen and green text. Yep. It reminded me of The Matrix. There were like so many things where I'm like, oh, this this led to this movie later this led to this movie later yeah. most of them were about the expanse but there were other little sci-fi things all over the place it's hard not to be influenced or like no because for things that don't exist and then once somebody creates it and puts it in a movie or in a book you're like oh that's how that is that's how it is in real life and then when you're creating your own piece it's hard not to to have that visual or that idea of how something might actually work you know it's hard to erase that like we're always influenced um, and it's not a bad thing. I think you have to take some of those things and include them because it makes sense. Yeah. I really liked in that um, memory, the making of the alien documentary, they even talk about like, listen, alien is not like a fully original idea. We're pulling from the thing from another world, forbidden mm-hmm. planet, planet of the vampires. We're pitching it as jaws in space. Um, so I, I think that's really cool. Like, it does feel original to me. Um, and it's certainly earlier than most of the other like movies that we've talked about. Um, but I think it's cool that it's like pulling from this tradition and expanding on it in a way that is like so hugely influential for the rest of the genre moving forward. Uh, one thing I was not sure about, why didn't the company just send a bunch of androids? Because it doesn't seem like the alien is all that interested in Ash. Like, he never goes after him. I wonder if he even understands that he's... I mean, he's not a human. He's not a little blood bag waiting to get killed. But right. why didn't he send a bunch of androids? It seems so much more efficient to me. Too expensive. Mm. Yeah. Too expensive, and you don't have a movie. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Uh, but um, You know, the other, th- the other to that point, I don't think there's a there's at no point is Ian Holm looking for the alien. You know, they, they always, they get themselves into trouble when they go looking for the fucking thing. It might've just wanted to be left alone, you know, for all we know. I don't remember where I had heard somebody make that same point where it's just like all these people going all this trouble over so many movies of like, let's go touch this alien. Why don't they send androids? It's like, don't know because, because the company's just that evil. If I was running this company, we would do things very differently. <laughs> well, don't worry. They tell you all about where the company came from in a really stupid way in Prometheus and Alien Covenant. So, no. so. Actually, maybe they really did need a human host. Oh. Maybe that's why you cannot send a team of androids. Exactly. I feel stupid for not thinking of that. Oh, I... I just wrong with yeah. Well, I, I mean, it makes, and it makes, now that makes perfect sense if you consider the other movies. Yep. For sure. Because they go into it, what its life cycle is. And they even go as far later on in the franchise to just be like, when it comes out of this animal, it's different, you know? So, but could the company have known that? I don't know. But again, those are those unknowns that like, they're fun to talk about like this. But then some asshole in Los Angeles tries to explain it and it, and it just kind of ruins it. Yeah. You know? And those are things that we don't have to know that. But also right. if you think like if the ship is in space and it's doing whatever its original mission, whatever it was there for, it makes sense that it's the humans who are normally doing that job. Like if it's basically just like, um, like a semi truck in space doing mechanical stuff, it just makes sense that those would be humans doing their normal. They're humans going to work and that's their job. And if you want to sabotage the mission by putting the droid on there and having an alternate route and having them have to wake up and go to this moon and find an alien, um, you need the humans to be that piece. 
Well, that also becomes like a little bit of like a, a I, I don't know that this was the intention, but it could be like a little bit of a social commentary, which is like these particular people, they don't fucking matter. You know, we send them out um, like no one's going to miss the these, you know, people that are bringing a, a cab of ore back to Earth. Like, yeah. who cares? You know. Somebody's going to miss Harry Dean and his Hawaiian shirt and his ball cap that he drinks disgusting like water off of. Ugh, I'm not. And his weird little cigarettes. <laughs> they all smoke those weird little cigarettes. It's Harry, cigarettes. Dean. Harry Dean's gone. Is he, so a is, he, is he a musician or something? Or how do you guys know him? Harry Dean Stanton? Yeah. Character actor. He's in fucking everything. Oh. He's been in like hundreds of, he's a He's been in everything, hmm. um, and he's basically himself most of the time. He just, but he's also so good. He's just amazing. Hmm. There's a really good documentary about him. Yeah, yeah, and he's just. It's like I knew him from like the Green Mile, and now Pretty I'm in Pink. Up the Pretty in Pink was probably the first time I I saw him. And Pretty in Pink came out when Aliens, the second one, came out. Um, <clears throat> He plays Molly Ringwald's dad in that. Anyways, but he, he ends up in everything and he's in a bunch of David Lynch stuff. That's how I became even more familiar with him in the 90s was like, and like him being such good friends with David Lynch. The Escape from New York. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. So he's just, yeah, he just, he pops up kind of as like that guy. He plays that guy and nobody plays that guy better than him. <laughs> like he's just, yeah, he's synonymous with a lot of my early movie watching stuff yeah Yeah. he just died a couple years ago he was 91 when he died yeah i was getting freaked out reading that um with i think one exception the order that the characters die in this movie is the order that they died in real life really this is something that you would figure out allison this is totally (laughs) now I made a, a very involved spreadsheet. I was going to say, you've got a spreadsheet. I, this is awesome. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting fact. I, cause I didn't, I thought it was very bold and I guess it makes sense to get rid of Scarrett first since he was sort of the leader that sets up Ripley as being the one who's going to be taking charge. And I was just sad to see Harry Dean go cause Harry Dean's Harry Dean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So speaking of deaths, so now we, have our and now we have our like all right fuck it we got to get off this ship moment where you essentially have ripley takes the lead tells everybody what to do and they actually start listening to her for a change Mm -hmm. um and you have yeah koto and veronica cartwright are off in some weird room grabbing tubes what were they supposed to be accomplishing my guess is that they were gathering some Supplies. I don't remember exactly what it is because in that moment you're. I don't even remember what the lines are there. As many times it was something seen. for the shuttle. It had. To, I read something about it last night. It had something to do with the shuttle. I have a note around this point that made me laugh, which was space cat carrier. So <laughs> there's a special yeah. little uh, Wayland Utani issued cat carrier thing. <laughs> um, I also th- th- general note about Jones. He's a real prick for diving out of every corner that he that he's in and scaring everybody. You're getting yeah. scared. You're like, wow, well, ah, things are coming. Things are crawling. Things are coming out. Right. But it's not the alien yet because right. that's a very slow trickle. We don't get to see that full alien. It takes so long. And the unknown is much scarier than things you've already seen. Yeah. The unseen is way scarier. Well, and part of what makes these deaths, even like the deaths of Lambert, Lambert specifically, her death is like you don't see it, but it is implied to be somehow worse mm-hmm. because you see the tail kind of go up her leg and it's like although we don't, you know, at no other point in the franchise are we given any indication that the aliens do anything sexual. There is something like violent and terrible vibe. about her. Because it, vibe. Yeah, and like the way that you know something that I, that I paid attention to on this watch is Ripley is hearing all of that happen and it's like is that over a headset or is that over a loudspeaker thing which is this interesting because why don't they all have like headphones in a communication away like when they're off hunting for the cat individually as more than one person does it'd be a way to like hey i'm here for the cat and i'm in a room and there's a hiss and maybe you know what i mean like it's in this room now especially since we see a headset thing used earlier when ripley's communicating with the guys down below when they're trying to fix the ship 
one random thing that I thought about a lot during this scene is um, I have to assume it's like a homage to this, but um, in one of the last Hunger Games movies, there's a scene where like in they're in this like big underground bunker and they're about to get bombed. And so um, Katniss realizes that her sister went back for the fucking cat. And so she has to go find her sister and rescue the cat. And I think it's even like a, I don't know cat like um, types or whatever, but it's an orange cat. So it looks very similar to Tabby. uh, Tabby. Is that what that is? I'm a dog person. I have no idea. Some sort of a cat. But I did read that there there were like four or five different identical cats that played Jones. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And the the fun fact with that is that Ripley or uh, sorry Sigourney Weaver thought that she was having an allergic reaction to one of them, and she was terrified mm-hmm. because she was just like, oh shit, they're going to have to find a new cat. But she was having a reaction to the glycerin that they put on her to make her look like she was sweaty. <laughs> so. so she had to make her own sweat from there on out. <laughs> remember what they what they used in place of it but they they figured something out because movie magic they just used some of harry dean stanton's sweat <laughs> 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 it's a stop dripping from this <laughs> it's, it's, in it. little, <laughs> <laughs> it's in his trucker cap they just scooped out the trucker, trucker cap and just like yeah. that i was i was living in a small town in the czech republic with a good friend of mine and this was pre-internet days, and we could not remember the name of the cat from Alien. <laughs> and there's no one to ask because it's all Czech people <laughs> who haven't even seen this movie. We spent the entire day trying to remember it. And all of a sudden in the evening, my friend yells, Jonesy! <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I miss those d- days of analog where you had to just sit and stew and stew and think and think. So one of my only notes for this part is, hell yeah, Jones is going to survive. I was so worried the whole time. As soon as he's in the carrier, I was like, oh, he's good. He's going to make it. But they do fake you out a little bit because, so now Ripley's on her own. Ripley and Jones. The other two are dead. Um, so now we begin the long stressful mechanical siren filled strobe filled sequence which is Mm -hmm. i think third most intense thing in the movie Mm -hmm. but it's prolonged and it's like Mm -hmm. this is where i had the note that i was like nobody does terrified better than sigourney weaver because when she turns that corner and sees it and it's just standing there then she leans back on the wall and the strobe is blinking on her face. Her eyes are, are open so wide. And it reminded me, Allison, when you were talking earlier about the great movie ride, mm-hmm. that's how we see her on the great movie ride. She's yeah. leaned up against the thing and she's turning her head side to side and her eyes are wide open. And she is trying to look like she isn't there for this oh, alien. No. The animatronic looks nothing like Sigourney Weaver. No. If you had told me when I was in like fourth grade that that lady was the lady from Holes, I would not have believed you whatsoever. The lady from Holes. <laughs> <laughs> Allison, thank you. Oh, that's good. That's good. But along the same lines, I had like such a visceral reaction to the beginning of the self destruct because the alarm plays on the great movie ride and so instantly i was like Mm -hmm. i felt like i was back on the ride and i was like oh my god so tense so like spooky even in watching the movie you felt like you were there and there was an alarm you're like oh it's counting down you're like come on you're just rooting for her to finish the job and get to the shuttle and get off like you don't realize that she needs to kill the alien you just think she's trying to get to the shuttle to escape which is essentially what happens and then she has to kill the alien but it's just she can't get past the aliens she's on a mission to kill well, she goes through this whole big, uh, one of my favorite practical things in the movie is when she's arming the thing, how it has like a hundred little steps and like that mm-hmm. weird little key of all those little images that she kind of brings her finger across. And it's just like, how the fuck could you have understood what that meant? And like, you gotta read it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but she's going through and she's got, she's pulling those tubes up. It's just this like perfect, like, you can't even fathom what this device is, but you just know that it turns the whole ship into a bomb, essentially. 
that has the all important, like, okay, you have five minutes before you can go back on this. Basically what's left of her being on that actual ship is just stressful and intense. And she gets a chance to talk shit to, to mother. Finally, when she goes through the even more stressful thing of trying to reverse the whole process. And she's like pushing the tube down to try to make it go faster and stuff. It's just this perfect tactile yeah. stuff. I love also in that scene, the personification of mother. Cause, um, she yells out, you bitch! Like she's blaming mother for not being able to shut down the system. I just thought that was great. But how many other movies have you ever seen where there's a countdown where the hero fails? Like exactly. ever? Have you ever seen a 10, 9, 8, and they're rushing and they're doing something and they're pressing a bunch of buttons <laughs> and it still doesn't work? Doesn't it's make like, it. Oh my God. Yeah. Like you're, you're so crestfallen and you feel so hopeless at that point. It's like, oh, now what do I do? Now you just get the fuck out of there. But God damn it, I forgot the cat again. <laughs> exactly. I love it. She's got to go get the cat. We get that nice little moment where the alien's just kind of looking at the cat. I love how dedicated she is to getting that cat out of there. <laughs> <laughs> that cat is optioned for another movie. <laughs> Even if you think think back to like them breaking protocol and not doing quarantine when they first get the guy with the face hugger, no one's worrying about saving lives then or following the rules. But yet you've got to have you know Harry Dean go off. Oh, let's find the cat. Let's go find Jones. Like it's just like oh protocol. Everyone's got to find Jones. We can't like get, leave without him. Like what? I just thought that was hilarious. They're contractually <laughs> obligated to keep the cat alive. But I guess because, you know, deaths of animals tend to hit people more harder than deaths of humans in movies. Like, we can't handle the death scene of an animal. But I just love that, like, everyone is just like, oh, well, I'm going to go get Jones real quick while you all try to battle the alien and try to escape. And oh, I'll go find Jones later when it's, we'll, ta- we'll tag team. And, like, <laughs> I would love a spinoff where Jones is actually the, like, secret antagonist of the whole thing. <laughs> Jones is like, oh, I better go get lost so this motherfucker will come find me. <laughs> Jones is a robot! He's a goddamn robot! <laughs> Android. He's like the, the thing that's in Inspector Gadget. Um, Inspector Claw, Dr. Claw. What's his name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could tell I was feeling like so stressed out during this because my notes are like Ripley better hope the alien is on her escape ship. She took so fucking long to get back. Why hasn't she checked the ship out? The alien's probably hiding. Why isn't she looking around? Why hasn't she done like a full search of the ship? And how does the alien get back in? How does he get on the shuttle? Dude, she takes so fucking long to get everywhere. I'm sure it was just like it it probably just walked on. Like no There's There's this little moment that they show you that that door had been opened to that ship when she was prepping it and that, but oh. that she had to go get the cat where it's just like, Oh yeah, the door was just a jar. So it could have just gone in there. And based on what I observed this time, when she f- runs into it or on that corner and hides from it, it's on its way down there anyway. Mm-hmm. I think. That makes sense. But so now we're <laughs> off the ship. We're escaping. We're seeing more kick ass miniature work where it's flying away. And then we have a really, honestly, pretty bad looking explosion. <laughs> My and notes are whoa, the self destruct was so crazy powerful. What the fuck? It's like, pfft, like yeah. five universes exploding. And it happens three times in a row. Yeah, it's weird. And it's like, could that, that could have been like, there were a whole bunch of like extra things of fuel or something that's just you know whatever there's like the she blew up a really big shit in regards to the door to the escape pod being open that reminds me of so many different like haunted house movies where like they show the front door and it's like open and someone's like oh you forgot to close the door like oh why is that open it's such a classic like trope and you wouldn't be paying attention to it in this because you're so it's there's so much smoke Blow, like there's there's lights and smoke and this this siren noise and this voice that's telling you that it's too late and you know you have so many distractions i mean it is genuinely sen- like sensory overload at that point that you're not thinking about like like you have, you don't even really have a good sense of exactly where she is in the ship at a bunch of those points you just know that you're in a a, a hallway of a corridor and you know it's 
but it's perfect in that way because it misleads you yeah. and you don't think about on your first watch you don't think well the alien's probably in there it's just another time that it's faking you out i feel like we talked a lot about the cat but i have something else to say about the cat Please. so she the spaceship explodes she's in there she's relaxed she's taken off some clothing she gets jones and she tucks jones into his little pod so jones is now safe before any of the extra stuff that's going to happen on the ship when the alien appears jones is safe but i also have to wonder about like when you're writing the script you have to think about well, where's the cat at this moment because i feel like animals like especially cats and dogs in movies are so secondary like there's just a random stray dog running across the street our family has a dog at the beginning of the movie they do eight thousand other things You're like, but where'd the dog go like you never find out where the dog went why is the dog in in the other scenes but in this movie you've got to know where the cat is and so for me it was so poignant that she's just feeling relaxed and she tucks jonesy into bed and closes his little pod and she's getting ready he's just taken care of because you don't got to worry about him when the alien appears and him getting sucked out the hole well, anyway. the other thing I think about is, um, like, in terms of the story, you almost have to put him away because we saw in the scene where Harry Dean Stanton is looking for him that the cat, like, hisses when the mm -hmm. alien shows yep. up. So it would have been mm -hmm. an early... It, yeah, like, you've got to let the cat on. World. Yeah, it would have been, like, a clue early. I had mm -hmm. no idea that this fourth act was a part of the movie. I was fully expecting her to be like, yep, cats in the thing this is ripley signing off last survivor of the nostromo or whatever so then when it's hand shot out i was like i knew it was in the ship i knew it was in the ship why didn't you check this shit out hey sigourney pull up your underwear <laughs> oh my god yeah <laughs> there was a thing i think it was for aliens the second one there's um the movies that made us where they talk about aliens and sigourney mentions the underwear and how tiny they were like, how is that comfortable underneath these giant space suits? You literally have like this teeny little, like almost a thong on. I'm like, how? Further disrespect from the company. It's company issued underwear to make you uncomfortable. Put on a real pair of underwear, like cover her crack. <laughs> you already <laughs> gave them full size adult diapers. Like yeah. you could do a little more. <laughs> <laughs> That's how she relaxes. You do have to wonder if Sigourney Weaver thought, oh God, I have to do this one, I have to make this one stupid compromise to get this movie done and, you know, better that than a nude scene, probably. I mean, you right. do wonder, you know, what the pressure was on her. I'm, I'm sure yeah. she was probably not thrilled to have that scene portrayed the way it was. She looks great. Her body, very fit, looking very nice. Knowing that this script originally didn't, it, like Ripley was not written as a female part, it was written as, I'm sure that they added that in. And that just pisses me off because you know, if it had been a male protagonist at the end, he wouldn't mm -hmm. be in little fucking whitey tighties right that don't now. even cover his butt crack. Like, come on, what is this? Yeah, it's like- Harry Dean been the lone survivor. <laughs> And he's only in he's his Hawaiian his shirt. Cat. He's in his boxers. He's just kicking back, petting the cat, having no, his space dude. gear. I want to see him in those same tidy whiteies. I want to see Harry Dean Stanton's butt crack. Oh, he's got some oh, stained hair. underwear, a stained <laughs> a pair of underwear. Like, oh, oh I love yeah. it. And he wouldn't. He would be like rolling a cigarette or something too. <clears throat> and the cat would be out. He would have left the cat behind. He was like, <laughs> screw this. <laughs> I will say that this this scene, this whole sequence, it's cool, it's good, but it definitely lowers how threatening the alien seems to me. Yes, um, absolutely. It's maybe my biggest criticism of this movie is how this scene plays out. Mm -hmm. Because it's there's not a whole lot of tension because you're like, there it fucking is. And then it's just hanging out in the wall for some reason. And it's just moving its little fingers around. And, and so it, it stops being this like thing that feels like a apex predator. And now it's just like, it's tired. And maybe it is tired. It's had a, it had a big day of <laughs> killing all kinds of people. We, it hasn't eaten anything as far as we know, because we don't know what it eats, but it's just hanging out in that wall in there. And then, then she 
smokes it out with with the whatever the hell that mechanism yeah, is on the ship. Seen. Yeah. And for what? And then she suits up and that's pretty cool. Blows it out of the ship, has her has her sign off. I th- I think for me it's like th- this is I think the aliens did a better job of what like it took this sequence and improved it. What with the mech suit and the queen and everything, I think it's a better realization of this. Um, mm-hmm. it's, the, it's just the only scene in the movie that just doesn't perfectly work for me. And by the by the time you're done, you're like, oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know why they needed to do that necessarily. I liked the hook of it. Like I said, I wasn't expecting it whatsoever. So that was actually one of the most surprising parts of the movie is I had not had that part of the movie spoiled for me whatsoever. Um, One of my notes is, is she going outside? Because that suit is not going to protect her. We Mm -hmm. already saw the face hugger just go straight through the glass of that other guy's suit. So I wonder if it was like more of a vulnerability thing. Like she doesn't want to fight this thing in her underwear. Yeah. You also see the alien for more than you have the entire runtime of the movie, which I do think sort of detracts from the scariness of it. And then when it gets blown out the airlock and when it's like hanging on, like surfing outside the ship, (laughs) it it looks like a guy. (laughs) It looks like a really tall man in a rubber suit, which, yeah, it did kill it a little bit for me. Because you do see so much... I feel like they could have shot it differently where you would have been able to see just pieces of it instead of seeing the whole, because it looked like a little action figure, like just like floating in space where it would have been more, for me would have been more fitting if you would have not seen that much of it because you saw so few of it through the entire film, which you got used to and you were piecing the other what you thought it looked like. Yeah. She has time to like hum a little song to herself and and like start this little process on the to open this door and load this little gun. And then she still is scared by it, where she like looks over, she's like, oh shit, it's there's the thing that I definitely yeah. already scared out of the wall. It's just it's just like it, it feels clunky to me. But uh, there was one thing that I read where um Apparently, Ridley Scott had wanted the alien to bite off Ripley's head and then make the final log entry in her voice. But the producers vetoed this idea as they believed that the alien should die at the end of the film. (laughs) That would... Huh. Imagine if... If I'm going to imagine it at all, I'm going to imagine the alien also in those little tiny whinies. Oh, I'm, well, see, I've gone right to Jones in underwear. <laughs> or Jones is putting on a little spacesuit, <laughs> launching I it did, out. I did pull up something about the underwear, and Sigourney Weaver had no problem with that, and she got backlash for it. And after hearing people's reactions, is when she thought that she shouldn't have done that. But at the time, she didn't think she was demeaning herself or anything. She just voluntarily did it. And she said something about how. She spent the whole movie full of like this blood and guts and sweat and grossness. Why would Ripley not take off her clothes at the end? So at the time, though, Sigourney Weaver didn't have an issue at all. It was the reaction of other people. And then Cameron got it later, I guess, too. Cameron said to him that stepped over the line. Her, her underwear and aliens is way more egregious. <laughs> <laughs> see, I kind of like the end scene because we really see how the alien has blended in with the walls and all the pipes and the tubes. And it makes you, it made me think, wow, um, technology and science and computers are just like the alien. And I think that's a really kind of interesting idea that, you know, it, it's so inhuman, both the technology and the monster are, mm-hmm. are so similar to each other. So I kind of like that, how you see the alien is almost part of the ship. I totally agree, because for me, that was one of the most powerful moments in the film, was watching a larger shot of the alien. You can see the pulse, and you can hear the breathing, and it blends into the scenery so well. And for me, it threw it back to the very beginning when they land on the moon and are in that spaceship to what y'all call the space jockey or whatever it's called. It's similar where it's like blending into the background where the ship and it it all looks the same. It's the same. So you, if you take what Christopher was saying about this um, living, breathing thing connecting with or intersecting with technology, I liked it. I really liked that scene a lot. 
Yeah, I do. I do think that it, it, it does blend in perfectly well. I remember being really surprised by it the first time I saw it. And now, like when I watch it, I know exactly where to look and it still blends in so well. And it probably gave everybody in the theater a big scare. You know, because you think by that point that the score has died down, all the all the tension of what came before it has died down. You think you're good. That stuff's that's all great. But to see it just hanging out. But I wonder if you think they did it because they didn't want it to appear like a cliffhanger. We needed to see it floating in space so we knew it was not attached to this ship. Is that why they had to do that? That's the only thing I can think of is we needed to know that it was not on it anymore. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's like you could have made that. I guess you, they probably had some limitations with how large that actual set piece was, where it's just like, well, we can't have it run around the room because it can run about four feet this way and four feet this way. Mm-hmm. But probably just limitation stuff. Also, I think that based on just the way that the, the guy that was in that suit, you know, I think that he probably had probably pretty limited mobility and what he could do in it. You also the difference between this movie and the other ones is it does not move fast at any point ever. It's always moving really slow. In fact, there, there's like that, (laughs) there's a scene, I think it's when he kills Yafit Koto maybe where he's, where it's like from the side and you can kind of see him doing like almost like these ballet moves or something. (laughs) Um, But anyway, the whole movie, it's moving slow. It's, but I'm sure it was still, it was scary to people then because it was a totally new creation. Mm-hmm. You know, unless you had H.R. Giger's artwork, you had no idea what the hell you were looking at. But yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, well, I'm doing a thing that I would caution other people from doing, which is like, don't compare it to what came after. Because it's not really it's fair. Hard, though. So. But I think it is harder to watch. So, just because knowing, seeing other films that this movie inspired that came later. And also as a viewer or a person who's been like in the world, you've seen all those things. Like when Allison, you're watching it for the first time, you've seen all these pieces before you're putting them together. So to watch the film for the first time, it's hard to not, it's hard to discount all that information. But I also think it's been super interesting though, to, to sit down and, and think about that as we're watching the movie yesterday in, you know, 2022 versus like when it came out in 1979, I and having all of the history and the films that we've seen and can compare things to, um, it's been really fun. I think it's been fun to, to pick it apart and kind of look at it with fresh eyes, but also think about what it inspired or things that it's done. Cause that's part of the film history with this movie is what it was able to do for, for technology and, uh, and future filmmakers and future like sci-fi slash horror films. I think that's really important to take into consideration because it, it left a huge footprint um, on the future of film. And the chest burster scene is like one of the best scenes um, in the history of film, as we've said. That was one of the biggest things I noticed watching this for a first time is for me, it was like almost an exercise in realizing how enmeshed in the, in pop culture it is. Like Mm -hmm. I knew so many of the plot points I've seen this picture from this thing, or, you know, the new movie came out. So this was spoiled for me. And I think that's like partially a product of just how the internet is like it's impossible not to use the internet a lot and avoid spoilers of any kind it's just impossible to do Mm -hmm. um but i thought this movie was still really fun i'm super glad that you picked it matt because i feel like there was just this gaping hole in my like repertoire almost like this is such an iconic movie it's such a classic movie and such an important movie in terms of sci-fi in terms of horror in terms of just film in general and to have not seen that like i just thought it was like so rewarding and like super fun so thank you of course i remember being really surprised when you told me you had never seen it i would say that ranking this movie it is a very easy 10 out of 10 for me um i don't think that's a controversial thing at all uh because this is again this is an important movie that people love um in terms of like how much it scares me because it's you know what scares us and all that if i were to go to scare meter rating i would and let's for no particular reason give that out of five i would say four out of five Mm. um 
in the sense that like I can't quantify for you what five out of five scary would be other than I don't know, falling off a building in real time, maybe, <laughs> um, you know, that would be really scary. But for me, it's like, there are so many things in this movie that are scary and intense and, you know, but it's not enough that I'm like in abject fear the entire time. And part of mm-hmm. that is I'm desensitized to all horror of any kind and when I'm watching this movie, I'm just transfixed at how awesome the set pieces are. So even at points, there are certain points where I may be supposed to be scared as a pedestrian, but I'm going, look how cool that computer is, or look how cool that matte painting is. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's definitely scarier than, you know, than most of the most of the other movies in its franchise and most of the other movies that I kind of have in mind for this podcast so 10 out of 10 for the movie four out of five for how much it scares me i'll go next i actually totally agree matt uh i think the movie really transcends its 1979 creation date i also give it a 10 out of 10 and a four out of five on the scare meter my rating um well i don't rate on a 10 out of 10 out of 10, I don't rate on a 10 point scale. I rate on a five point scale. So for me to say it's 10 out of 10 seems really weird, but I do rate it out of, I rated all of the points out of all of the points. So it's definitely 10 out of 10, five out of five for me. Great movie. I think it's a perfect film. It's just, it's just good. Um, for the scare meter, I think part of my rating now in 2022 as a grown person who's seen it several times I don't find it very scary. Um, I love the suspense and the darkness and there is a sense of like foreboding in the unknown, which I think is amazing. Um, you're not waiting for those jump scares. You're just waiting for something to be revealed. I'll give it a three out of five. I think there's enough scary elements. I will say that after watching this movie last night and finishing it at 1130, I had a nightmare. And I don't wake up in the middle of the night screaming. I had a straight on nightmare last night that something was getting me. And I woke up and screamed and thought about my neighbor who's on the other side of the wall in my apartment. So something in the movie triggered in my brain as to for me feeling a fear of something coming into my area. So I will say that, but I still give it a three out of five. I think my nightmare was scarier than the movie, honestly. Um, but five out of five, perfect movie. And then three out of five for scare meter. Ridley Scott would take credit for your nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to actually give the same rating as you did, Amanda. 10 out of 10. I think it's such a good movie. Um, classic for a reason. And like has led to so many other great things in other movies that I love. Um, and then in terms of scares, I'm also going to go with three and a five. I, so many times during my watch, I just really wished that I could erase what I knew about the movie going into it. And the other thing I thought about a lot is I wish I could see it in theaters because overall I would rate it three out of five. It had really great tension in a lot of scenes, but I wasn't personally scared by it. With this movie, too, it's hard because it came out so long ago, and I've seen scraps of it as a kid. And if you watch Aliens, too, before you even see an alien, like, if I'm a 10-year-old, like, it scares yeah. me at 10. If I'm watching half the movie because it's on in the room, you know what I mean? It's different than watching it today as, like, a being in the theater and watching a brand new... Like, in 1979, the movie theater, this, like, th- this would have been a 5 out of 5. You know what I mean? I would have been as an adult. in that theater. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm like, eh. Because yeah. I wasn't afraid, you know? Right. But again, it's, it's just the, the point in time where we are and our, our, like, where we are in the pop culture. And Yeah, and I, and I don't know if, like, I'd, I'd be curious if there's going to be a theatrical experience in the immediate future, especially post-pandemic, where there will be a movie that has this big of an impact on everybody. I don't think it's possible because of internet the internet being there to spoil things but like, yeah you know i think the last like really visceral theater experience i had that made me feel like uneasy or uncomfortable or scared was was midsummer oh yeah um i think it, that's one of the most i i can't wait to see whatever that director does next um you know and and when you watch like the 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 part of the the documentary that I sent you guys the link to where they get to what the audience reactions were in 1979. It's like people were 
leaving the theater. People were throwing up in the bathrooms. People were like, you know, it was like people were freaking out. And like they were talking about people who had like it took them four times to watch the movie before they even saw the thing burst through Kane's chest because they were just like yeah. they couldn't look at it because it seemed too real. And like, you know, that's 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 an that's an enviable feeling. I wish yeah. that movies did that to me. You know, like I'm I, jealous. Yeah, yeah, I'm super we, jealous of that. Or if you think about something like Exorcist, like oh. there's so many movies who came out that long ago who were just like groundbreaking and so new and things that you didn't expect. You know, yeah. and I feel like now we there's still there's still a lot of ways where movies can be scary and fresh or present us things that we would not have expected. That is still happening in cinema across the board, all genres, but. For this kind of like, for especially for scary films or dark films or like horror sci-fi, it's those elements of, yeah, it's just magic. And then if you consider like special effects and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So we did a good job of grading it though, or ranking our scares based on like our information from today and considering what we did in the eighties versus now. And Yeah. Oh yeah. And I mean, I, I think that I probably would have said the same numbers that I did today that I, I would have said those when I was eight years old too. Because it was like, it scared me definitely when I was a kid. Didn't scare me as much as aliens did um, when I was a kid. But yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, we definitely all really liked it. So if you like what you heard today and you want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aadl.org, spelled exactly like it sounds. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. This has been What Scares Us. Thank you.